What up and welcome to the MLB Game of the Week pregame show presented by YouTube Shorts. Houston, Texas, Minute Maid Park, the site of the MLB Game of the Week live on YouTube. Scott Braun, CY Chris Young and Brett Dolan are going to have the call for you in about a half hour's time. But what you got to get you set for this pivotal AL West matchup as the Astros won in dramatic fashion on Tuesday to extend their lead into the division to six and a half games in front of the visiting Seattle Mariners. Luckily, the trade deadline has passed. None of these players will be traded for each other. <laughs> it's Anderson and Urquidy, the starting pitchers. And with that, we say hello from inside Studio 42, New Jersey. Mike Lowell, World Series MVP. I'm Stephen Ellison. Mikey, great Valley. to be with you. Okay, you say you just walked out of the Mariner dugout last night kicking the shorts because you are two outs away from cutting that division lead back to four and a half games. you got a chance at this thing now. Alex Bregman hits a bomb. Carlos Correa walks it off, and now it's six and a half. It can be gut-wrenching if you don't let it affect today's game. You know, I think that's the, the big thing because when you're playing these interdivision games, it's a two-game swing every day. It's not, hey, we won. Let's see how the team in front of us is doing. So, I mean, I look at it. My old high school coach, Dave Biseglia, would say for the Astros, guys, the knife's in. Now we turn it. Uh, you know, this is a chance for yeah. the Astros to really step on their throat and be like, yeah, you could have been four and a half, maybe three. Now you might be seven and a half. And now you're talking, as those games get shorter, we're at 23, 24 games left in the season. That gap is, is starting to widen if you're seven games yeah, back. Yeah, Houston can definitely sweep the leg and sweep the series with a win today in game number three. But it's tough for Seattle. Not only did they lose to Houston, but it was on a night where New York and Boston, another two teams in front of them in the wild card race, also lost. I should have said spoiler alert with the Bregman home run and the Crayo walk-up. Because if you missed it, then you didn't know that happened. <laughs> but here's the highlights from last night, just to refresh your memory. Now it's up to Bregman. He represents the tying run. Had an RBI double in the third, singled in the fifth. And Bregman hits it high in the air and deep to left field, and you can kiss it goodbye. Off the community leader signs, and we're tied. The runner at second for the Astros is Guriel. Correa is one for four today. There's a ball into right field, hit well. That'll be over the head of Hanniger. It'll bounce into the crowd, and that'll be a game winner. Astros win it. Robert Ford, Henry Callis. Harry Callis, Todd Callis on the call there from a thrilling finish to last night's game for the Houston Astros. Now we show you the AL West standings, the AL standings in both the division in the West and the wild cards. You see the Strohs six and a half up on Seattle. Oakland has really had a tough stretch at an awful time. Got swept by the Jays in Toronto, then lost to the White Sox, and they are now falling down the standings. Still three and a half games back to the wild card, Mikey, but a ton of teams in front of them. Yeah, I think it gets to the point when the games might not mean as much as the number of teams you have to jump. Right. Someone, someone's going to get hot. You know, and I look at the Mariners and the A's in that situation. You might say, well, we only have the Blue Jays and one, either the Red Sox or Yankees have to, you know, falter a little bit. But, man, you're asking a lot to have two, three teams down the stretch where I think the intensity increases, the concentration gets a little bit better, the rosters are expanding. So if you're playing a bad team, they might be testing some young guys out. You know, there's a chance to really, you know, separate yourself in that sense. So... Each of these games, I, I think as these last three weeks play out, they become more and more important. Mm. All right, Mikey, it's time to unbox the matchup ahead of our MLB game of the week here on YouTube, Seattle and Houston. Let's talk about both teams here, and let's begin with the Mariners because there's been a lot of talk about them throughout the year, the run differential. And they're like, well, what about our fun differential? The run differential and the record in one-run games, it's not, it's not sustainable, but here they are in the thick of it. Do you feel like Seattle is for real for the postseason this year? Well, the standings tell me yes. So I, I tried to dig a little deeper, and I said, you know, I'm going to find something that proves why they're in it. And I had a hard time. You know, when I look at it, these are American League stats offensively. Second to last in OPS, 12th in runs, last in batting average. I'm like, so how are they doing? Okay, let's go to the pitching side. The starter ERA is ninth. Their bullpen's been very good. Yes. Fourth best. So I'm saying if they can kind of keep those teams close, they can bridge it to the bullpen. And I think that kind of evens the matchup. They just don't swing the bats like the other teams in the American League that are buying for these playoff spots. So it's it's hard, but, you know, can you say, well, when they lose, they lose by a bunch, and when they win, they win by a little bit, and that's why the run differential can be skewed a little bit? I'm not so sure. The numbers don't tell me that. But the bottom line is, Nelly, 
they're winning games. Yeah. You know, and it's okay. I don't really care how you win it. It's right. At the don't point ask where, how. Yeah. I, I don't. At this point in the season, I'm not looking to what am I going to map out for the future. Well, there's three weeks left in the future. Mm -hmm. Off season, we can look through, you know, towards 2022. But as long as they can creep and claw and. Maybe those AL East guys, the Red Sox and Yankees, they beat up each other a little bit. They, they both have to play the Rays. You know, there, there is that opportunity where someone can get hot and a weekend can change things. You win three, someone else uh, loses three. It's a big swing in the division. And I think they have something like 10 games left against a couple teams in front of them in the wild card standing. So the opportunity is there. You talk about the future. It is seemingly bright. You can't, like, just bank on that for Seattle. But the future looks bright. And it also seems stable now with the recent news in the front office and in the dugout. You know, Scott Service extended his manager. Sure. done a tremendous job in the dugout for that club. And then Jerry Depoto yep. getting promoted and extended. So now these two working together, that collaboration, have an opportunity to build on the success that they've had this season. I, I think from an organizational standpoint on where you want to go, this is a great move. Mm. You know, it's guys they're familiar with, baseball guys on, on both ends. I believe it's guys that they feel like the rapport is not only with the players, but that communication um, with upper management. I think that's a big deal today. You know, I, I think everyone has to feel like they're on the same page. You know, when I, when I was coming into the league, I think sometimes you felt like baseball ops guys did their thing and then field staff kind of did their thing. And now the, the, that bridge has to be gapped. I mean, that gap has to be bridged a lot more than before because I think there are a lot of analytics and things that need to be explained to players on why moves and why roster construction is a certain way. So I think it does flow over into, into the team. And when I look at guys and I see Jared Kelnick, Mitch Hanniger, Kyle Lewis, I know he's banged up. Even the second baseman they picked up, the Kendall Graveman sure, trade had, right. you know, a couple, uh, I think people were sour on that. They picked Bad up Abraham. Time. Yeah, Abraham Toro. Like, this kid looks like a player. Does, so, yeah. so you start building that with success in the win-loss column, and I think you can have a real positive snowball effect in that sense. And something that you can kind of empathize with, relate to with the Mariners, you were part of a young team in Florida that lost a lot and then figured out how to win. And so that's something the guys in this clubhouse are maybe starting to do. Now, that's something that Houston has done. Sure. You know, was losing franchise, then won a World Series, and now look like another postseason juggernaut. They were last year, kind of flipped that switch. Do you view them having that potential again this year? 100%. I mean, I, I look at their lineup construction, and I love just how relentless they are. You know, they have the, the skill to put the ball in play, hit the ball with power. I look, okay, what do they bring from the left side? I say Tucker, I see Michael Brantley, and I see Jordan Alvarez. I said, wow, that's great, but do they stack them one behind the other? No. What do they have from the right side? You go Guriel, Altuve, Correa, Bregman. It's like, wow, this is this is a nightmare matchup for opposing pitching staffs and, and bullpens because, you know, especially with the rule now that you got to face you and the inning, you got to face three in a row. You're not really going lefty, pull them out, right? You can't. So someone's facing a guy in a, in a more favorable position. When I look at the numbers, it's like seven deep with an OPS over 800. You know, so it's it's a relentless attack with power. It's not just a bunch of guys that, hey, we're going to flip a couple singles. Well, the singles team needs three hits to drive in a run. No, these guys can, you know, you're a bloop and a blast away always from being in it. So their offense, when I look at, you know, their second in runs, second OPS, first in on base percentage, third in slugging. That's an elite offense. Yeah. You know, so they, they, there are a lot of things that they can do well. And they're at the other end of the run differential spectrum yes. compared to their opponent, the Seattle Mariners. One member of that lineup that Mikey's talked about, Alex Bregman, is going to join us in a little bit. People always mention this Houston lineup that Dusty Baker kind of has at his disposal. What about the pitching staff? I know the bullpen has left a little bit to be desired, specifically the back end, but the starting rotation, you know, even though no Justin Verlander and after the departure of, of Garrett Cole, they've had some young guys step up and step in. Um, I'm surprised that when I look at them, starter ERA is best in the American League. I don't think nobody's better said, than the Chicago White that. Sox. You know, everyone's like, oh, the Chicago White Sox, they're so perfectly planned. You know, they're perfectly form, formed to go into the postseason and make a long run. I just don't think it's your typical household names, you know. We all, you know, McCullers is actually having a real nice year. Granky's been banged up. I think that's more, it sounds like it's more of a precaution. Mm -hmm. So those are your two established names. Urquidy a couple years ago was huge in the World Series. You know, this guy, maybe not your household name, but a battle tested guy. 
You know, we, we can go down the list. Jake Odorizzi, Luis Garcia. Luis you know, Garcia. Yeah, you, you got guys that the talent's there, and maybe it's going to take a year or two before we really know them as a name that, you know, hey, wow, I don't want to face this guy, you know, on a uh, day game following a night game. You know, but they're just not there from a name recognition perspective. You know, I think the offense and the stars that they have kind of overshadow those guys. But their starters have been fantastic. You can't get better. So um, are they primed for a postseason? Yeah, I think the balance on what they do on the mound and offensively poses a lot of problems. It's tough for a team to beat that team four times. You know what? They also just have guys when they get to that October stage. You just like Carlos Correa being one of them and the walk off hit last night. You just know that they're going to do something when the October lights are on. Let's throw this poll question at you. We know every time we're together on the MLB game of the week before the game starts, we want to ask you, who do you think's going to win? Simply put, so this is our poll question. Chime in, Seattle or Houston? Is it a sweep for the Astros or does Seattle kind of snap this little skid and start chipping away at that Houston lead? All right, we'll step aside for a little breather. When we come back, special guest, Alex Bregman. We talked about it. Now we'll talk to him next. Here to left field, back on a Diaz, and he makes a nice diving catch. Diaz to the backhand, not a natural outfielder, but making a fine play in left field there on the slicing deep fly ball of the bat of Abraham Toro. That ball popped in the air, long run for Bregman. He's the only one that can get there, and he does in pound territory. Alex Bregman, a nice play to end the inning. Strike three called, runner on the go. That's a strike him out, throw him out, double play. Runner on the go, the throw by Stubbs on the money. How about that, Garrett Stubbs popping out, throwing a seed. Yuli Gurriel hits one high and deep down the left field line, and this ball is gone. Yuli Gurriel, La Pina, cuts the lead in half. It's now a one-run game. Now Carlos Correa swings and sends one deep to center field. That ball's gone. Back to back Jacks, Yuli Gurriel and Carlos Correa. And just like that, the game is tied at three. Two pitches, two bombs. Wow. Welcome back to the MLB Game of the Week pregame show presented by YouTube Shorts. All right, grab your chips and Breggy Bomb Salsa because it's been good since Alex Bregman got back in the lineup. Coming off the IL, 357 clip, 47. The numbers you see them on the screen, they're all good. Let's talk about them a little bit more with Alex Bregman himself, who's joining us now ahead of this game. Alex, look, I'm standing next to Mike Lowell. A champion like you, World Series MVP. I got respect for Mikey, so you get the first question. Well, thank you. I have a bias towards real good uh, third baseman. Third baseman, so yeah. fit that bill. First of all, Alec, I mean, you've been on fire. We saw it since you've come back. How's the health? How's the leg? Are you 100%? Talk to us. Yeah. Yeah, feeling great. Uh, thank you. Um, our, uh, our strength coaches and training staff have uh, done a really good job of um, helping me out with a prep routine and also just keeping me on the field and healthy for these uh, – for this final stretch run and it's been fun to be back with the guys and just trying to contribute in any way I can to uh, help us win a game. We talk about contributing. It's one thing just being back. It's another thing announcing that you're back like you did last night with that kind of moment. Can you just walk us through it? Because Seawald's been nasty. Yeah, um, yeah, he's one of the best. He's one of the best pitchers, uh, relievers in the game and um, was just fortunate enough to put a good swing on it. He's got two uh, really, really good pitches and um, just yeah, just tried to uh, square something up, use the middle of the field, and uh, fortunately caught it a little bit out front. Alex, last week you guys went into Seattle. They take two out of three. So coming here into Houston, is this a little bit of a statement series that you know they're chasing you? We kind of want to put our stamp on this series. Uh, I think these games were super important for us, uh, not only uh, for the division, but also just to start playing really, really good baseball down the stretch and. Um, they're an extremely good ball club. They got great pitching. Um, 
and uh, to, to win those two games was, was huge. But um, today's another big one, and um, looking forward to uh, hopefully trying to keep it rolling. So, Alex, you're well aware this is a special day around the game of baseball with the Hall of Fame ceremonies taking place up in Cooperstown, and people watch you. Your fans notice that you wear number two and think in part because that was where you selected in the draft, but also because of one Derek Jeter. So as you see the captain going into Cooperstown, just wondering what kind of what's on your heart and mind as somebody who grew up loving him. Yeah, it's super cool. Um, when I, growing up in New Mexico, uh, my mom was from New York, actually. So growing up in New Mexico, she was always uh, a big Yankees fan. And um, I always rooted for, for Jeter and loved the way he played the game. and. Um, just how he posted every day and played played hard and um, left it all out in the field. So um, I've been a big fan of his um, since I started playing baseball, and uh, that's super awesome today. You and a lot of people. Alex, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about your manager because I think there was a little bit of, a, I don't know, a hesitation from a lot of the baseball guys hiring Dusty Baker because uh, Houston was such an analytics-based organization. Now this is, you know, the players coach, an old-school guy. Is there something about Dusty Baker you've learned this year that maybe you didn't know before? Uh, he loves this team. Um, he shows up every day and um, works his tail off to help us win games. And uh, I think it's a perfect combination of, uh, of the analytics and, and also the, the baseball. And uh, um, it's really important to have, have baseball guys and – um, Dusty's been awesome, um, been helping us all, and um, we, we love going out there and playing hard for him. To your point about loving the game and working, the last time we had an Astros YouTube game, I got to talk to your teammate Kendall Graveman, and he took us back to your days in the SEC. He was finishing up at Hale State, and you were just getting started in Baton Rouge, and he remembered a series where you made an error to – potentially cost the Tigers the game. And what Graveman remembers is hours after the game where the lights are still on at the stadium and you were taking grounders from a grad assistant. Do you remember that story that Graveman shared with us? Yeah, I think a ground ball went between my legs and Mississippi State beat us. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, yeah, facing him in college, uh, he, was, he was really, really good. And they had a really good team, actually. Uh, Adam Frazier was on that squad. Uh, I think Renfro was on that squad. Yep. They have a, they have a bunch of big leaders off that team, and then also Mississippi State won the won the uh, College World Series. So us uh, us Tigers got to uh, bounce back this year uh, and, and take over the SEC again. <laughs> Graveman's been talking a lot of trash. There you go. <laughs> I it. There you go. I it. My uncle went to LSU. He's a huge fan. He's lived in Baton Rouge for 30 years. Your football team took it on the chin last week. Are we going to make it up against McNeese State this Saturday? <laughs> oh. If they don't make it up against McNeese State, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> He's going to be watching. We, I think he goes every home game. So this is a big one for him. They don't care McNeese State or anything else. You got The Tigers got to take care of business at oh, home. It's a must win. Must win. Hey, but Garrett no, I need, uh, I need some Tigers in my fantasy football team. I need Jamar Chase and Odell Beckham to, to do well this year. There we go. Did, hey, did Garrett text you after that UCLA win over LSU? No, he didn't. Um, I, I think he knows that I was I was pretty uh, upset. He was that was very classy of him. I got I got plenty of texts though. I got plenty of texts though. Just yeah, that, it wasn't a good it wasn't a good loss. No, it was not. Uh, Alex, when we have somebody on the YouTube pregame show, question we always want to ask is, did you have a did you or do you have a favorite YouTube video of all time? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I actually do. Um, yes. I got my favorite YouTube. My, my favorite YouTube video is uh, Eric Thomas, um, the hip hop preacher. He has a uh, he has a video of um, how bad do you want to how bad do you want it? Uh, watched it every day when I was in college and uh, it's pretty motivational. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Okay. E.T.'s the man. All right. I like it. I got something to do. This <laughs> yeah, there we go. There we go. Any final thoughts, Mikey? Rooting for you guys. I mean, this is, in my opinion, the most balanced offense in the American League. Do you feel like you guys just present major matchup problems? It's power from the left side, power from the right side. Is that kind of something you guys can take into the postseason? Yeah, I, I, I definitely, I, I definitely believe in this lineup, and I think uh, one of the biggest things is 
the the power, but also the bat to ball skill and the and the ability to walk and not strike out. And I think that's one thing that that plays really well in the postseason is is making contact because of how elite the pitchers are. And um, I mean, we, we we got a we got a long way to go to get there, but um, I'm very confident in this lineup down the stretch. And um, the, uh, I just want everybody to stay healthy and, and, and feel good going in. Hey, Brady, before we say goodbye, I just want to relay a message from Ro Flo, Robert Flores, you know, diehard Astros fan, and he's saying, I want salsa, Brady Bomb salsa. <laughs> Lance McCullers Jr. told me that it, it's actually truly great, so Ro Flo wants you to send him some. Yeah, so a lot of people, uh, a lot of people thought it wasn't going to be great, but it's legit. Uh, I got, I got some. I'm going to send some to the MLB Network studio, and for everybody else who's watching this, they can go to BreggyBomb.com and grab some. There we go. I like it. All I right, like it. Good Alex plug. Bregman back for the Houston Astros at the Big Bomb in this series against the Mariners. Looking to do more here on the YouTube Game of the Week. Breggy, thanks so much for the time, man. All right, have a good one, guys. Thank you. All right, let's turn that on. The creator spotlight once again, shining on Kofi Yaboa, who is, of course, the engagement editor for Secret Base. And if you're on the Internet, you know, Secret Base isn't so much of a secret. Wildly popular. And, you know, Kofi and I have been floating in, like, Internet orbits for a long, long time, but I've never gotten the chance to actually talk to him. Let's change that right now. Kofi, it's awesome to finally do this. So for those who are uninitiated, with Secret Base. Tell us a little bit about your channel and what you've been working on. For us, Secret Base is a channel of sports storytelling. Um, we don't really deal with the day-to-day, uh, -day, like sports talk kind of things. We like to tell stories of old through uh, our video series. We have a thing called Beef History. We talk about famous uh, arguing. So Bobby, <laughs> Bonilla, Bobby Bonilla versus the Mets, Dusty Baker versus Tony La Russa, you know. And then we have a series called Rinder where we look at historic sports moments and we talk about all the things that led up to said moment. Um, we also have other series called Dorktown, Weird Rules, High Score, and we kind of just rotate those throughout the years. Um, so that's what we do at Secret Base. I love working there. It's just, it's just great. Wildly creative, and I, I mean, that's as simple as I can put it. If you haven't checked out the channel yet, please do so now. Uh, Kofi, you talk about the beef history, Bobby Bonilla and the Mets. How about the Mets and, and Mets fans, you being one of them? Uh, but all, all, all <laughs> that being said, they're, they're still hanging around with a, for a postseason spot. Do you have belief or are you dead inside? Uh, I've been dead inside for years. Uh, it's been it's been years and years, you know, where even though no matter how it's I, I root for these teams where even though all this hope is spring eternal, it's like in the back of the mind, you're just like, is is this another going to be another letdown? Mm. Is this going to be another disappointing season? Because the thing is, is that when you root for a team like this, you've seen it all. Yeah. Right. You've yeah. seen it all. You've seen all the hope. So now you're like, I root for this team. However, at the same time, I'm not going to put all of my chips <laughs> in, you know, all this stuff. So it's it, it is what it is. Like, we you know, we were we were in first place in the East for a little bit. And we had that slide. And I was like, there it goes. Right yeah. now. We're now they won on my birthday, which was yesterday. So that was good. Um, I was like, OK, so and, and we're close. That's the thing. It's like we're never like. It's like we're too close, right? It's like close. It's like a Sisyphus. It's like Sisyphus pu pushing the the ball, rolling the rock up the hill, and then the rock just like magically yeah. falls down every year, every single year. <laughs> uh, Moses Messina, our producer right now, he's also a diehard Met fan. He's like, this is so true. Um, okay, so you're in you're in New York. Uh, obviously, the Mets are yes. in one borough. In a different one, you have the Yankees, and they're celebrating Derek Jeter, their captain, going into Cooperstown, the Hall of Fame today. And you and Secret uh, Base, you, I know. <laughs> okay, let's talk know, about the video excited. that you no, just did. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about the video you just did at Secret Base. You did a deep <laughs> rewind on the famous flip plate. Now, we just have Buck Showalter right. walk by, and I worked with him the other night, and he likes to say, Jeter was late on that play. What was your big takeaway from rewinding that back? I think that the thing about that play that's most interesting is that there's always this kind of debate on was it necessary and was it effective, right? Mm. So there's always, you can always do this estimation of like, okay, if Jeter doesn't cut that ball off, is Giambi out, right? Or is Giambi actually out? There's people that argue that. So it was kind of interesting uh. to look at this thing. And that's the thing. It's like, 
it was an important play. And the thing is, if Jeter cuts that ball off and then Giambi is safe, I feel like we'd be talking about, did Jeter even have to cut that ball off? So it's a, it's a very interesting play like throughout uh, history that like, you know, it kind of cemented his legacy as like, he is going to be like one of those all time, like he's like a special player because like, I have, I've never seen someone cut the ball off that close to the catcher. And then it's like, it's, that's the right play to do, yeah. you know? Yeah. All right. Last one from me. Is there anything that you've seen in baseball this year that you think one day you would want to do a deep rewind, a deep dive, or do a storytelling piece on for Secret Base, whether it's a player or a team or a moment? Um, I am not sure yet. I have, I, since I don't work on the rewinders or beef histories or anything like that, I think it would be interesting. So I actually will, I'll say this. We are yes. working on a fumble dimension yes. that is revolving around a certain player okay. in in the American League West. I won't tell you who it is. Can, is it bro I feel like bigger people can figure. <laughs> does, does it uh, rhyme maybe, with bro Who knows? Who's to say? <laughs> who, who's to say? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I call it secret base because he's keeping it a secret. Uh, that's right. I, it, but, again... Kofi, huge fan of your work, have been for a long time. It's been amazing to watch you blow up the way you have. And again, for those who haven't seen Kofi's work in the team at Secret Base, please check it out. But uh, awesome to link up with you, man. Hopefully we could do it again soon. Absolutely. Anytime. There he goes, Kofi Yaboa. Oh, look, Tyler Anderson, one of the deadline pickups for Jerry Depoto. He's been really good for Seattle. They need him to be good again today. Hard the other way. Got a chance. Fair ball. Yes, indeed. Kyle Seeger scores, and the Mariners have a 6 5 lead. And a big hit. And on the ground, base hit. Right field corner. JP walks home. Mitch strolls home. Kyle Seeger, Chuck Ching. 5 3 Seattle. And a 1 0 Mariners ball game. Strong. Three called, that's the ball game. The Mariners pitch back to back shutouts. High drive right field. Got big time carry, splash that baby. Three run homer, Kyle Singer. Eight five lead for the Mariners. He drills this. Drills. What an at that. Wonder what the vibe of the clubhouse will be tonight. Four nothing Mariners. It's the MLB Game of the Week pregame show presented by YouTube Shorts. It's time now for Picks to Click presented by BetMGM. Mike Lowell, Steven Nelson here inside Studio 42. One question for you, Mike, as we're watching an AL class here in the Game of the Week. Who is your pick to run the table in the American League? Wow. I'm going to sound like a front runner, but the Rays are so deep. Hey, there's so nothing wrong with being like, chalky if it's right. Yeah, I mean, they're, they, they hit, they can pitch, they beat up on good teams, they destroy bad teams. I got the Rays. And they never say die. I think they have 43 comeback wins this season. You, you just can't kill Tampa Bay. They're no longer this upstart. This is a juggernaut in the American League. So as we go from Mikey's pick to click, we now want to show you your poll results. We asked you who you thought was going to win the game of the week here on YouTube. Seattle or Houston, 65% Mike going with the Astros. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Home team coming off a great win. Two-thirds of the guys. No problem. I'm with them. I know. I, I, today, I, yeah, it's got, <laughs> it's got that feeling. 
today, that, or this week anyway, that Houston is just going to make a statement. But big they, game for the Mariners. Massive. It game. is a huge game. They got to bounce back from a, from a lot. You know, there are losses that are gut wrenching, and some that eh, we were never in it. That last night was gut wrenching. Again, two outs away. Up. Oh, that's tough. Hey, flush it. Mikey said at the top of the show, flush it. Don't let it turn into a bad a, one loss. Turn into two. All right, we're done here. Scott Braun, Chris Young, and Brett Dolan have the call, and the MLB Game of the Week live on YouTube. Enjoy. They love hardball in downtown Houston, and the home team has been rewarding their fans for years with big success inside this ballpark. This year, more of the same, and it's not just the playoff appearances, but even a night like last night, a comeback walk-off against a relentless division foe. This is the MLB Game of the Week, live on YouTube, presented by YouTube Shorts. The Seattle Mariners are in town to clash with the Houston Astros for some Wednesday baseball at Minute Maid Park, and the Shows have built a six and a half game cushion in the AL West. Thanks to wins in the first two games of this set, these two will close the book on their season series today. Oakland's collapsing. They've dropped four in a row. The wild card is where the drama's at in the AL postseason picture. The M's are involved with just a few games to make up and a few weeks to go. Oh, this is gonna be real good. Scott Brown along with the former All-Star, Chris Young, great to see you. And also, you liked the playing in this ballpark a little bit, A little didn't bit, you? a little bit. I think okay. if we pull my numbers up, I had some good times out here. Okay, good. I think we're gonna pull his numbers up at some <laughs> point, but let's start with numbers for the Seattle Mariners. And I will say, their general manager, Jerry Depoto, has talked about this team having a short memory. Well, keep it really short, because we can go a long way when it's talking about a playoff drought that is longer than any in professional sports at the moment. This team was awesome in 01. Yeah, we'd have to go all the way back to 2001. And, and this is a team I would think you've seen, Randy Johnson, Griffey, A-Rod, but no, none of those guys were there. They did have Ichiro, they did have Edgar Martinez, Brett Boone, Mike Cameron. This was a team that played great defense, had great pitching and a lights out bullpen. And then the rain came for a long, long time, see why? This team still has a drought that they're hoping to wipe away this season. It's possible eventually when the rain does clear, it's going to be glorious. Although it's not the 2001 team, this team is built completely different. But they're a bunch with a group of young players. Scott Service has come in and taken a group of young, young guys and allowed them to come out and have fun, play the game, compete play great defense, and find ways to win close games. So there's two mottos. I see one on the screen, why not us? And the other is, it's been a minute, but <laughs> they're working on it, OK? Longest active playout dr playoff droughts among the four major North American pro sports. Well, the Mariners, at the moment, take the cake and all the rain. I guess they're due, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good way to put it, OK? It's a law of averages. The Mariners are due, and they do have a young, exciting ball club. But yes, it's been a minute. While the Houston Astros have seen a ton of success in their organization, where even last year they had success, but it was a weird 2020, not just for them, for everybody. It was a weird 2020 for them for multiple reasons. Number one, we have to admit you're coming off the cheating scandal. The pressure was on the Astros. They didn't have Burlander. They didn't have Alvarez. Correa had a very down year coming off of the year in 2019, which everybody got questioned. Altuve was in the same boat. Coming out, people were questioning, what team is this team? What are the Astros made of? 2021, they come back strong, and they're doing what they're always done. Yeah, and that is Breaking, good pitching, elite defense. They barely have any weaknesses. I can't seem to find too many of them. I mean, when you look at this offense, it's arguably the best offense in the game. They're strong from top to bottom. I mean, you have Kyle Tucker in the seven hole, six hole tonight. Bregman's back off the um, off the DL. They're, they're playing great defense. They, they're pitching well. They're the team to beat. You can see the fewest strikeouts. That's on the hitting side. Then on the pitching side, despite what we showed you at the no, not okay corral with no Verlander, and of course they lost Cole a couple years ago, 
They're top five in starting pitching ERA in the league at three and a half. And there's the defense. It doesn't. It doesn't take the superstars. McCullers or Keedy going tonight. Luis Garcia, I mean, going for Rookie of the Year. They are strong from top to bottom. I don't even know what their team's going to look like in the playoffs because they have so many strong suits at the top of the lineup. They're going. Dusty's going to have some decisions to make. You're right. That's what this time period is all about. Guys like Jose Urquidy, who's pitching today, is he going to be good enough to crack the playoff rotation? We'll find out soon. And you mentioned Correa. The spotlight has been on him all season long. And for more on Carlos Correa, let's kick it to the third member of our team. Brett Dolan has more. Thanks, Scott. Carlos Correa was indeed the hero last night. A walk-off double in extra innings as the Houston Astros took down the Seattle Mariners. Now, Carlos has been a key part of this franchise over the last several years. And for the fans, they're curious about what his future looks like here in H-Town. We were here two weeks ago when Carlos's quotes came out in the Athletic regarding his future. Speaking almost in past tense, trying to win another championship to lead this organization with two of them. Now. With Brian McTaggart, about a week later, he cleaned things up saying, obviously, I do not have a contract for next year. Who knows? He would be happy to stay here if need be. If not, he'll go play for somebody else. Now, when free agency is looming, you wonder what that might do to somebody mentally. Well, Carlos, is he pressing or not? Certainly, he got off to a very good start, as you'll see in April and June. Hit 296, 15 home runs, almost 50 RBIs. Since then, 51 games, he's at 251 with just seven home runs. Now, Dusty Baker has an explanation. Carlos was sick around the All-Star break. He said he was very weak. It wasn't COVID. Didn't feel like he was quite the same hitter, but things have changed. Now, I did ask Dusty whether or not he takes the temperature of Carlos just to see where he is, and he says yes, but not mentally, physically. Carlos wants to play a lot of games, wants to keep him in the lineup and maximize his health. But he is hoping that last night is the key Going forward, more of those big-time hits to win games for this team in September and beyond. Minute Maid Park is the site of our YouTube Game of the Week. Roof closed today. Our lineups and our first pitch coming up. The Mariners and Astros on YouTube. Good start for the Mariners. First pitch swing at J.P. Crawford stings a single into right. And there's a base hit. And shoots to the right side. J.P. Crawford is aboard. The opposite way. And away from the shift. Crawford is two for two. On the ground, Crawford pops up. Couple of skips, plenty of time. Keeps a run off the board and ends the top of the third. What a play by J.P. Crawford. Oh, right back up the middle. Crawford hit that on the button. He's aboard for the first time. Now the Mariners have the go-ahead run on base. JP hitting the ball pretty well and getting good results lately with this hitting streak. And it continues right here on the third pitch of the ball game. The other way, and JP continues to thrive doing that. Castellanos can't believe it. JP Crawford cruising in the second with the devil. He's two for two. He goes the other way, base hit. Kelnick scores. Marmo right behind him, and J.P. Crawford, what a day. This is the MLB Game of the Week. Live on YouTube, presented by YouTube Shorts. Watch and create videos on YouTube. Try Shorts in the YouTube app on your phone. Scott Braun with Chris Young and Brett Dolan, and we do a lot here on YouTube on a weekly basis, and we're thrilled to have you join us here and be part of the party. And also, our latest feature allows you to control the audio. You can personalize your listening experience. It's the multi-track audio. Hang out with us. You can click for the home or the radio calls, mix it up. Do whatever you want. You do you on the speakers. Tell your friends, youtube.com slash MLB. It's free for everyone to watch today on MLB's YouTube channel. We have mic'd up players, dugout interviews, the whole deal. And let's get this game rolling with Jose Urquidy matching up against Tyler Anderson, your starting pitchers. And both of them actually have quite a few similarities, CY. A lot of similarities. We got two four pitch guys today, but we'll start off with Urquidy. He's a four seam slider, change up curve guy. He's using his four seam majority of the time, about 55% of the time. So he's trying to establish that fastball early in the game. And
and then get guys to chase after he gets that established. And, I mean, he's in the top five and lowest averages with that changeup, so I expect to see that changeup quite a bit today. The Mariners need to take this one. They dropped the first two in the series. Let's go over the keys to the game on the Seattle side for the visiting ball club brought to you by YouTube Shorts. So for the Mariners, they just have to stay within striking range. I mean, they're leading the league in Major League Baseball in one-run games with 29 wins. So if they, if they can stay close throughout the game, they, they'll be in a good position to get to that bullpen. Anderson, he has to bring out the paint brush today. He has to stay away from the middle of the plate. He's not a big below guy at 90 miles an hour with his fastball. He needs to stay from the middle of the plate. And Seeger, I see him being clutch in a big situation today. Urquidy, a reverse split guy to where lefties don't hit him as well. Seeger's gonna come up in a big situation. He's the leader in that clubhouse and they go as he goes. And now let's run through the YouTube Shorts lineup card for the visiting Seattle Mariners. They check in at 75 and 64 on the season. J.P. Crawford will lead the way. Then Hanniger, Seeger is having a monster second half power-wise. Ty France can do it all at the plate. Toro was the big trade pickup. Torrens is the DH today. Kelnick is the rookie with big promise. Tom Murphy will catch and hit eighth. And Jose Marmalejos in the nine spot. Urquidy looks around, ready to go. Just activated off the injured list for a start against San Diego. This is start number two since then, and we are underway to a global audience on YouTube today. There's Crawford's excellent on base percentage during an eight game on base streak. He fouls back the 1 0. So Jose Urquidy checks in with a 3 4 2 ERA on the season, and he'd been out since June 29th with right shoulder discomfort. He left a game against Baltimore after an inning and a third. That was the second time he had left an outing with that issue. And Crawford drives one to right field. There's Tucker floating back. He makes the catch. So Urquidy popped back up against San Diego. Two runs, four and a third, 71 pitches. He went two times through the order. This is the arsenal that he's working with. A lot of four-seam fastball, slider, and changeup. And he's a reverse splits guy at StatCast 3D, powered by Google Cloud, hooks us up with his arsenal. I see him using that changeup, hopefully, a little more today, especially with four lefties in the lineup today for Seattle. And lefties have struggled greatly against his changeup, so I see him pulling that out in pressure situations to where he needs a big out. Rikidi has had big time results with his changeup. I see him being aggressive in the zone early. We we're talking to Dusty Baker before the game today, and he's coming off the, um, the IL, had a good start, his first start. He's trying to establish early, trying to stay in this game as long as he can because there's a good chance he's going to be on the pitch count. I like what his manager, Dusty Baker, told us this morning as we check out the odds courtesy of BetMGM. First off, I'll tell you that quote in a moment. The Mariners going up or down on three and a half runs today. What do you think? I, I have both teams swinging the bat well today. I'm going to go over. Over? Okay. Cutting a miss there from Hanniger. I'll give you the line from Dusty this morning on his starter. He said he can throw strikes in his sleep. If anything, maybe throw a few less strikes, which you never hear about pitchers nowadays. And you always have guys like that to where you know if you get in a situation to where you have three balls on you, if you're hitting in that situation, you just assume he's going to throw you a strike, which sometimes work, works in your favor and, and makes guys expand their zone a little bit. There's Dusty in his 24th big league season managing. He's been in the game for many decades, 72 years old. That's pulled off the third base bag. It's a fair ball and a base hit for Mitch Hanniger. Marwin Gonzalez handling the hot corner today. And not much you can do about that one. I think the bag may have played good defense right there. <laughs> may have saved the double. That's true. First start for Marwin Gonzalez since signing a minor league contract on August 27th. There he is. Beloved by both the fan base and by his teammates. Bregman getting the day off after the big homer last night. Yeah, last night was epic for the Astros. Alex Bregman 
It's a game tying two run home run in the ninth inning off Paul Seawald, who had been money this season. Oh, he's enjoying the day off his feet. Oh, <laughs> put the feet up. Get comfortable. You'll be there. You'll be there until about the sixth or the seventh, and you better start getting loose. And then it was Carlos Correa with the walk off double in extras. That one is looks like off the mound this time. And it's going to turn into another infield knock. Marwin Gonzalez has to eat up the baseball. And Kyle Seeger is aboard. Have you ever seen that before? One off the base, then one off the rubber? Not on back-to-back -back plays. And there's a good chance that that's a double play ball. I mean, you see Correa right there, behind the base right there, behind the mound. I think he he might have been off his foot. Yeah, he feels that ball, steps on second, throws the first, inning over, just like that. You heard the little click sound. If it was off his foot, do you make sure he's okay? I mean, Keaty's not flinching, so. Yeah, normally you look to the dugout, you give him a nod. I'm fine. Let's keep the game rolling. And he's a guy that likes to pick up the pace. Keaty is ready to go when he gets the baseball. And he fires a strike to Ty France, who's hitting 340 since August 10th. And second best in the American League to the magical Wander Franco, the super rookie on the Tampa Bay Rays. Ty France, he's, he's not a huge name, not a guy that... He does that. A lot of people know, but he hits. Opposite field knock. He uses the entire field, and now the Mariners have loaded up the bases here in the first with just one out. It's a great piece of hitting right there. He's a San Diego State guy, taught by the late great Tony Gwynn. He's able to hit the ball all over the field, consistently put together good at-bats not expand the zone, stay in the strike zone. And to see a big guy do that, hit it all over the field, go the other way, it's nice to see. That's why he's in that four hole. I don't think there's many players that Astros fans would go, oh, not this guy, but Abraham Toro fits the mold as he digs in with the bases loaded. Biggest hit, I would say, of his life at this point was a grand slam against this Astros team in a win about a week and change ago. He has been a different ball player since putting on this uniform. And it's nice. I, I mean, I know he struggled a little bit when he was with Houston earlier in the year, but when you get traded to another team who was in playoff contention, you have the pressure on you. There's a little backlash from it. You want to go over there and make a good impression. So for him to come out and start hitting right away had to take a huge weight off his back, allow him to go out there and have fun. He's continued to play well. In this situation with, with Seattle, I mean, I think they have the, the highest OPS in baseball with runners in scoring position. So you're trying not to let this game get out of hand too early. We're in the first inning. You don't want this to happen. <laughs> No deja vu, says all of Houston at the moment, because on August 31st, in Seattle, Abraham Toro with a grand slam smash, and that was the difference in the ball game for the Mariners. Feeney gets a swing and miss. It's a one-two count on Toro. So that was the big trade right near the deadline. Toro heading over to Seattle along with Joe Smith. Kendall Graveman was the big pickup in the bullpen for the Astros along with Rafael Montero. And actually timing wise, it was coming off a big win for Seattle and Graveman was a huge part of the bullpen. So it didn't look great timing wise, but Jerry Depoto explained. So Toro fouls that one back. The deal had to be made on that very day. And here's why, Montero was the key. He was designated for assignment by the Mariners. The Astros wanted him, and if they had waited another day, Montero would have been available to anyone on waivers. So the deal had to get done, even though the timing wasn't the prettiest. There's so many things that happen behind the scenes that us as fans, or us even in the game, just don't know about. Toro rips one to right field. Plenty of open space. He's in business, and the Mariners crack the scoreboard for first. Here's Hanniger. And Seeger will score as well. It's a two RBI two bagger for Abraham Toro, and he continues to punish his former squad. Got to put a slide, a smile on your face early in the game. 
Is that a change up left up in the zone? Yeah, we have the change up. You see the three fingers right there. That's his go-to pitch right there. Right there, you're assuming that you want to get it out with your best pitch against the left-handed bat. Toro's able to stay through that ball, get it up just high enough, and put the barrel on it, hit, hit it to the right field line. Altuve is like, dude, take it easy on us. 11 games against Houston for Toro. Six extra base hits, 14 RBIs. He has been a lightning rod in the lineup for the Mariners. This is a player they picked up in a trade, too, a different one, but it's also working out for them. Luis Torrens in his last 20 games, hitting close to 300. This is a game that you're always making adjustments. He had a slow start to the year, ended up getting op option down. But in mid-June, came back up and has been swinging the bat well ever since. Sometimes when you have those up and down moments through a season, you're able to make adjustments, clear your mind, and come out ready to go. France at third, Toro at second. You mentioned this team being excellent with runners in scoring position. Well, they're two for two with runners in scoring position here in the first. Hitters 2-0 count for Terenz. Lays off a pitch inside. It's 3 0. Kuyu needs to find a way to get back into this count. Not sure if he's trying to, he's okay with the walk here, getting the runner, getting the runner on first base. You have the base open, try to get the double play ball. Four pitches and a free pass for Terenz. YouTube channel saying Toro against the Astros since the trade has been crazy. True story. I mean, that trade was highly criticized, not just locally, but I would say on a national level just because of the way it looked optics wise. You're trading away maybe your best reliever is a team that was very much involved in a playoff run and still are. They're three games out of a spot. Nobody knows about Abraham Toro. He's kind of buried on the bench for the Astros and look at him go. That's when you have to trust your guys in the front office. You have to trust trust the plan. The, the Mariners are trying to put themselves in a position to be really good for the upcoming years. And to do that, yeah, you have Graveman for the rest of the season, but what do you do for next year? So Toro's a guy that you can have. He comes over, swings the bat well. You have hopefully a second baseman, maybe a third baseman for the future, and you have team control of him for a while as well. So it's so many things that go into these decisions that front offices make. And it's tough for the players to deal with them sometimes, but you just have to trust the process. Toro is under team control through 2026. They're looking to build something with longevity in Seattle. And they're hoping this young man at the plate is a big part of that. Jared Kelney takes the pitch low. It's another miss for Keedy. And Christian Javier is getting warm in the Houston bullpen. We're here in the first. Good news for the Astros is they're off tomorrow. So you can empty out the relief pitching group if need be. And that's another missed spot for Keaton, which is really rare to see from him. This is, like I mentioned, a guy who can wake up and throw strikes. He can, and, and he still can throw strikes in this situation. What he's hoping right there is that Kelnick has been scuffing a little bit, hopefully hoping that he would expand his zone a little bit. So great job by Kelnick to stay within himself. These are the type of at bats where if you're a young guy and you've been scuffling quite a bit throughout the season, these are the type of at bats early in the game that you can have that can turn this last month of last month of the season around for you. Come through in a clutch situation like this, kick them while they're down. Even if it's just a walk, that's a good at bat. That's an RBI. Keep the line moving. And the plate discipline has been there for Kelnick in his minor league career. There's been a lot of swing and miss in his game in the majors. Nice stop there by Maldonado to prevent a run from coming across. 
Kelnick goes after the 3 1, got under it. And Tucker's coming in close enough that it's not going to be doable for a tag up. And it's just a fly ball out. Kelnick worked himself into a favorable position right there. Got a good pitch to hit. Just jammed himself up a little bit. I mean, that was a good pitch to put the barrel on. And sometimes when you're just a little bit off, get extended too early, and you jam yourself a little bit. And you see that ball running in on his hands just a little bit, but in a hitter's count, if you're feeling right, you're ready for that pitch. Catcher number eight hitter Tom Murphy. 27 pitches in this first inning from Jose Arquiti so far. First pitch strike to just two of eight hitters. There's a strike. It's one and one. I mean, if he gets out of this with just two runs allowed, it's a big, big win on his side after the way that this inning started. If you can get out of this, you get back to the dugout, you settle in, you come back, you let those two runs go. You come out and start fresh, and you trust your offense to be able to recoup those runs. Murphy in the air. That's Who's got win. it? Yeah, it's going to be a big win when it comes down into the glove of Carlos Correa. A four-hit, two-run first for the Mariners. They loaded up the bags a couple times. It could have been much worse. The two RBIs, of course registered to the account of Abraham Toro. The trade's working out for both sides. Bottom of the first coming up. He does pull it. That's a base hit into right field. Around third comes Yuli Gurriel. He's going to score. This game tied up at three. RBI single Kyle Tucker. Runner on the go, and Tucker called safe on a pitch just off the plate. Kyle Tucker drives one deep to right field and gone! Two run home run, Kyle Tucker. Astros take the lead 5 3 in the eighth. That ball was demolished. Nice little bat flip at the end of that for him. As Tucker hits one pretty well to right field, all the way back is Myers, and he'll watch it go! The back home runs winning the game last night and adding to the lead tonight. Holy Tucker. He is seeing some fastballs and he is demolishing some fastballs. Breaking ball. Tucker goes the other way. Fam giving it a look and this ball is there and in play. Now it bounces into the crowd. That'll be a double for Kyle Tucker showing power to all fields. It's the MLB Game of the Week, live on YouTube, presented by YouTube Shorts. And they also present this Astros starting nine with all the big boys in there besides Bregman. Altuve, Brantley, Guriel, Jordan, Carlos Correa with dynamite numbers against Seattle this season. Kyle Tucker in the sixth spot. Oh, Astros fans, you're spoiled. Jake Myers has been a super rookie. Marwin Gonzalez is back with the Strohs. And Martin Maldonado will catch and hit nine. Tyler Anderson on the mound, left-handed pitcher, ERA at 4.35. He's been even stronger since the Mariners picked him up. Another shrewd move by the front office. Tyler Anderson here, another four-pitch guy, similar to Urquidy. He's a four-seam cutter, change-up sinker guy. The difference of the two, I mean, his velo, his fastball velo is around 90 miles an hour. What he's been able to do all year long, though, is create opportunities for swing and misses. He expands the go, expands the zone, hitters chase, and they know that he throws a lot of strikes, which is what allows Altuve to be very aggressive in that situation. He knows that he throws a lot of strikes. And clearly, Jose Altuve was aware, went after the first pitch, popped out to the shortstop, J.P. Crawford, now StatCast 3D, powered by Google Cloud, with that arsenal that you were going over. A lot of four-seam cutter change-up, and Scott Service told us the cutter 
is as good as it's ever been for him right now. It's becoming more and more of a weapon. And that's what you have to do to keep hitters off balance. If you're a guy who throws a lot of fastballs in you and you're throwing 90 miles an hour, you need something to get guys off the barrel. And this is something that pitchers like CC Sabathia were able to do later in their career. They threw a lot of straight fastballs, but they needed some type of dece deception to get guys off the barrel. And that's why he's using his cutter in different situations. You see on the graphic right there that he has curveball that he throws from time to time. But talking to service before the game, he knows that he's a fly ball pitcher. And he knows that that curveball is a ball that guys hit in, hit in the air. And in a stadium like this at Minute Maid, you don't want too many balls in the air. Yeah, that's not a pitch he's going to dial up very frequently. It's just for fun. 1-1 one, one to Brantley. It's a ball and two strikes. This was a huge re-signing in the offseason for Houston. Mr. Consistency 300 plus since 2018 and he signed up for this and next year with the Strohs. Brantley is just a guy year in and year out. He gives you consistent at bats. He never tries to do too much. He's very quiet at the dish. Not too much movement. So with that being said he's able to replicate his move time and time again. Stay through the middle of the field and come through in big situations all the time because he never changes his approach. Call him Uncle Mike in Houston. He's a mentor for many. And he makes contact on the one two. A nice stop by France at first to the covering Anderson for the out. Ty France has played some sneaky good first base D this year. Ty France is a guy that he had to work on his defense. He, he was originally in the middle of the infield. He had to work on his defense, and he's arguably the best first baseman in the game, in the game right now with, with defensive run saves at three. Which is crazy. I mean, the Mariners also were fortunate to have Evan White in that spot, and he's been down this year with an injury. But Ty France has more than filled the void not only on defense of course he's been a great bat for the team but Scott Service made it a point this morning to tell us about how good Ty France has looked on a daily basis at the position and there he goes showing us what it's all about here in the first. Now Yuli Gurriel taking a strike on the outside corner and back to France real quick with service when you lose a gold glove first baseman. It has to mean so much for your team to be able to replace him with another gold glove, gold glove caliber player. Anderson working both sides of the zone. You know, I can't look away from the delivery too. You mentioned the deception with the cutter, but there's the pitch again. Tyler Anderson almost looks like he's starting up his bike with his foot. Gets a swing and miss and a strikeout to end the frame on a 10 pitch first inning. Three up, three down against a very potent Astros lineup. Mariners carry their 2 0 lead into the second. Aletmi's Diaz stands in. He's the DH today. On the ground, Toro can't handle it. Correa is in. Meanwhile, Guriel is right behind him. He scores also. Two runs are in. And the Astros lead it 2-0 with nobody out of the second. Here's getting the start in center field, coming off a road trip where he hit 300. He drives one. Deep to left field. Forget about it. Three-run bomb by the rookie Jake Myers. And the Astros jump out in front. Five to nothing. Here's Alvarez, ninth man the bat in the frame. Alvarez whistles this one deep to right center field and that's going to get down for a base hit and go all the way to the wall. Altuve scores. Alvarez trades places with him. He's at second with an RBI double. 6-0 Astros. Jordan's 90th run batted into the season. Runners at the corners. No one out for Tucker. And he drills this one into left center field. That will be down for a hit past the diving Jared Kelnick. Correa scores. Here comes Gurriel. He'll be waved home. He's going to score. Two RBI double for Kyle Tucker. And the Astros in double figures. It 
It's 2 0 Seattle in the end of this season series between the Astros and the M's. They also made a trade on July 27th. Graveman and Montero to boost the bullpen for Houston. And Joe Smith is added to the bullpen mix for Seattle, along with the now great Abraham Toro. And that's the OPS heading into today, where he's already contributed an extra base hit and two more RBIs. So our first poll question is very relevant. Who got the better of that deal? Astros, Mariners, it's a wash, or too soon, too soon. What do you think? I would say as of right now, you would assume that the Mariners got the best, better end of the deal. But that could change very fast. If this continues to go on, the Astros go to the playoffs, Graveman's coming out late in the game to close out, to close out a big World Series game, I mean, that argument could easily switch to the other side. Right now, it's so easy to say Seattle, but you just don't know what the future holds. Toro has been smashing the baseball for the Mariners. Graveman is a big part of the back end of the pen now. Urquidy delivers another strike there to Marmalejos in the nine spot. I think the other thing to keep in mind, not included in that trade, is the acquisition of Diego Castillo to help out the Seattle bullpen and fill that void left by Graveman. And that bullpen is what has allowed them to be in the position that they are right now. Without that lights out bullpen that the Mariners have, service is handcuffed and they would not be in the position that they are right now and able to win all of those one run games. Help us out with the poll question right now. Four choices. It's posted on your computer screen, mobile device, whatever it is. That's in on the hands of Marmalejos. And into the glove of the rookie Jake Myers for the first out. It was a first inning full of traffic for Seattle. After J.P. Crawford flew out, there's Mitch Hanniger off the third base back. I think that was off Urquidy's foot. It was like, where did it go? That was Seeger with the infield knock. And France contributing the opposite field hit to load up the bases. Toro brings two home with the double. Terenz follows with a walk. Kelnick flew out and Murphy popped out. So two runs. They loaded up the bases a couple times, but they left them loaded as well. The Mariners come out of the first with two runs off Jose Urquidy. And we'll see if he bounces back here in the second inning. Second time through the order for Urquidy. This is Crawford again. Crawford able to put together a great at bat last night. Big moment of the game, big two out RBI, 3 2 count, pitch off the plate, able to stay through the middle of the field and continue to be clutch for this Mariners offense. Two of the keys the Mariners will tell you to them being involved in the playoff picture right now, despite just okay overall team stats bullpen like we talked about and the money with runners in scoring position Crawford's one of those that leads the pack he's 333 in those spots doesn't have one of those positions at the moment but hey I'd rather be better with guys on than nobody on and he's been very valuable to this Mariners organization on both sides of the ball talking to Scott before the game he called he considered Crawford the quarterback of the infield although you have Seeger there as the leader of the team him and Crawford on the left side of the infield. He just snuck a bunt, but it's a foul ball. That'll load up the count for Crawford. All right, YouTube creators, help us out here. Poll's still going. We'll keep it open for about an inning, but Secret Base is actually our creator spotlight. We'll talk more about them later. I think the real answer is Toro got the best end of it. That's true. Abraham Toro has blossomed. That's a great point right there. Sometimes. You can get caught up as in a log jam as a young player with the organization that's always in playoff contention. Crawford spins one to left field. Brantley chasing it towards the line in the corner makes the catch for the second out. A few things the Astros are going to have to do today to continue to be great, to continue to come back and try to win this game. First thing they're going to have to do for my key points, they're going to have Anderson. He has to throw strikes. You have to make him throw strikes today. He has the third highest chase rate in Major League Baseball, throwing 90 miles an hour. If the Astros, who don't strike out a lot, are able to get him in the middle of the zone, they'll be just fine today. 
They have one of the best defense in the game. You have Correa and Altuve up the middle of the field. Continue to play good defense and keep the line moving. The line, line is so deep. You have Tucker in the sixth hole today. You're never out of the woods with this offense, so continue to keep the line moving. Don't try to be the hero and allow your offense to just do its thing. A ball and a strike to Hanniger. You're right. Yesterday, trailing by a couple runs, you're in the ninth inning. Oh, Alex Bregman's up. Oh, by the way, we have this guy waiting in the wings who just came off the DL. Hasn't gone deep since June, but don't forget, don't forget who he's been for our organization. He didn't forget. Oozing with confidence. Look in some of Correa's statements after the game. It's like that offense knew. Everybody in the dugout knew that Bregman was about to come through in that situation. He's facing Seawalt, who missed with some sliders, quite pretty big sliders. And he had to come with the fastball. And Bregman, although he had no homers off the fastball this season, he was able to come through in that situation. This would be a nice recovery for Jose Urquidy. That's fouled off. The only thing is the pitch count. But like I said, you have a pretty rested Astros bullpen. And you have an off day tomorrow for Houston. So even if Urquidy only goes four or five innings, really even four at this point, Based on him still working his way back from the injured list, he'll be in good shape. One, two, swing and a miss. There you go. After a four or two run, four hit first from Seattle, it's three up, three down from Jose Arquiti as we bounce into the middle of the second. Two outs, nobody on, no score. There's Altuve. All right, see what happens second time through for the Astros. Altuve hooks one deep down the left field line. This ball is gone. Home run. Jose Altuve. His first home run since July 30th. And the Astros lead one to nothing. Be a lot of fun to watch this guy get hot down the stretch. Kyle Seeger leads off here top six. This is pummeled out to right. Kyle Seeger leaving the yard and putting the Mariners in front. Two run Mariners lead in the ninth inning. Now it's up to Bregman. He represents the tying run. Had an RBI double in the third, singled in the fifth. And Bregman hits it high in the air and deep to left field. And you can get the goodbye. Off the community leader's signs, and we're tied. The runner at second for the Astros is Guriel. Correa is one for four today. There's a ball into right field. Hit well. That'll be over the head of Hanniger. It'll bounce into the crowd, and that'll be a game winner. Astros win it. Five to four. The walk-off double by Correa. Just what he does, TK. Gets big hits. Okay, let me fill you in on this new feature that I mentioned probably 10, 15 minutes ago. Fans watching the MLB Game of the Week live on YouTube right here have your choice of listening experience, and we're showing you how to do it. That gear icon in your player has an audio tracks button. You can select primary, that's us, home, away, radio call, go back and forth, do what you want. It's all synced up, seamlessly integrated on your favorite devices. You won't miss a minute of the action. It's all right there for you, a little new feature right here on YouTube on a weekly basis. Scott Braun, Chris Young, Brett Dolan hanging out with you on a Wednesday afternoon. Mariners and Astros playing against each other in the regular season for the final time in 2021. Alvarez, Correa, and Tucker do up here in the second against Tyler Anderson, who pours in a strike. Alvarez has been such a polished hitter from his first time in the league. He was a guy that I played against and sometimes you sit back in awe on how a young player can be so quiet and so confident at the dish. He looks like a veteran. <laughs> it's, it's, he looked like a veteran as soon as he stepped into the box for his first season. He also looks like a power hitter. This is a big, strong dude. And strong contact past the shifted infielder. Toro was in a somewhat correct spot, but it was smoked off the bat of Alvarez. And he starts off the second with a single. That's what you call hitting it through the shift right there. Yeah. Oh, you're shifting me? I don't care. You're playing me in shallow right field. 
I can hit it just hard enough to get by you. Nice effort by Toro. You're going, we're going to back you up 30 feet for moments like this. And yet Alvarez still comes through. Now it's Correa. Mr. Walkoff man from yesterday in the 10th. It's a leadoff walk-off double in the 10th yesterday. Runner placed on second base to start extras. And it only took one batter to end the game on Houston's side. Correa putting, that, putting together another really good season. It's nice to see him stay healthy, you know, throughout the year. It's a big year for him. Came out the gates hot. He slowed down a little bit, but even his slowdown is still very productive. And it continues to come through in clutch situations. Like this one. Last night, added to the resume. Good mustard on that one. And into the seats. Ground rule, automatic double, game ender. Astros take it. Some players just have what it takes. And, and they're able to, to dig down deep in big situations, slow the game down, slow the heartbeat down and come through big in, in situations. Correa has always been that type of player. He rips that one right into the glove at the hot corner of Kyle Seeger. Wow. Can't wait to see this exit velo. That's rocket retrieval right there. That's when you go into the dugout and everybody says, nice swing. You're like, man, I'm not trying to hear that. That should have taken his glove off of his hand right there. <laughs> 112 miles an hour off the bat will get you a right turn back to the dugout. I'll take the jam shot up the middle any day. <laughs> Gold Glover at third base. Gold Glove left side of the infield for Seattle. See, that was a play made by someone who has been at the position for a long time, and it was evident there. And you, you see even Seeger right there had a smile on his face like, <laughs> wow. Look what I found. <laughs> I still have the wherewithal to throw to first base, try to get the double play. And the defense in this series for Seattle hasn't been the smoothest, mostly talking about the outfield. So you need a game like this. Tucker into left center. Kelnick chasing it, and it's going to hop up against the wall. Alvarez heading for third, and he's being waved home, and here he comes. Throw is not in time. The Astros are on the board. It's an RBI double for Kyle Tucker to bring home Alvarez and make it 2-1. to one. Kyle Tucker just continues to stay hot. Dusty Baker loves him in the position that he's at. Some guys have their best years. If you're playing well in the sixth hole or seventh hole, there's no need to always move somebody up in the lineup. You allow them to settle in in their position within the lineup and continue to do damage. You see that ball hit into the gap. That's a tough play for Kelly to make. I mean, the way Minute Maid Park is built over here, all those little nooks and crannies, there's no way he could have made that play. And the ball beat him there on time. But with the drop, with the drop, he's safe. Yeah, the ball was fumbled there by Murphy. Alvarez scores. Tucker delivers again, and now it's Myers. Alvarez can move pretty well for a big dude. A big man, he's picking him up and putting him down. You know if you're on first base and that ball hits the gap, you better be trying to score for me, especially if I hit it. Morales behind the plate, so far calling a really good game. I thought the umpire behind the plate could be a quite big predictor of how this game goes. With a guy like Anderson, who's going to need to nibble a little bit. If the umpire forces him to come over the middle of the plate, this could get dangerous for him. Gets a chase there from Myers. It's one and one. What do you think of that little kick from Anderson before he delivers? Does that distract hitters at all? 
it doesn't distract you too much. The only thing that it messes with is your timing because you're trying to trying to create your timing off of his motion, trying to see when he's going to be releasing the ball. And that little hitch could throw you off just a little bit. Runners going, and that is smoked. It's a foul ball. Look out, Gary Pettis, third base coach for the Astros. Tucker will head back to second. Heads up base running by Tucker right there. A lot of times pitchers will fall into patterns. And, and they have to worry about that guy at the plate. And sometimes they forget about you at second base. So Tucker being ready in that situation, he could have he got himself an easy bat. Tucker can move too. And Dusty Baker told us this morning, that's a 30-30 guy we have in the six or sometimes the seven hole in the lineup. Jake Myers putting together a great at bat right here. Talking to Dusty before the game, he's trying to determine how do you de how do you decide between Myers and McCormick on who's going to be your center fielder. You have two young guys with the potential to be stars in this game. You're trying to keep them both hot. And today Myers got the call, but I think it's going to be a close race, and whoever's hot is going to get the playing time right now. McCormick hit the injured list a little over a week and a half ago with a hand issue. That's when Myers really took over the position. Now he's off and running. RBI machine since he was called up about a month ago. It's not quite Wally Pip, but once you get that opportunity, you want to take advantage of it as a young player. Time is called. It's not fun for the pitcher. By the way, kids, Google Wally Pip if you need help. <laughs> it's fair. If you're watching fair and enough, you're 12. Absolutely. You might be like, Wally Pip. I mean, there was a time I had to Google Wally Pip. Let's be <laughs> real. I'm not that old. It's a good story. Read and watch. Myers has done almost all of his damage against fastballs in the major league so far. See if that impacts this next pitch from Anderson. Here he comes. He misses in. Myers with a short, compact swing. He allows the ball to travel, which would help him. After the two strike count, it'll help him in these situations because he'll allow the ball to get deep. He's fine going the other way. He's not trying to hit the ball at the yard. He'll, he'll allow that just to happen. He homered on Monday off Kikuchi in this series a three run shot in the second that made it five nothing. Houston had a big 11 2 win in game one of the series. There's a swing and a miss. Anderson's second strikeout of the day. The grunt change up works every time. <laughs> Sell it. Sold. Took that out of the Zach Grinky book every time you hear that big grunt. You can just know to sit back a little longer anytime you hear the big run because he's trying to trick you. <laughs> now Marwin Gonzalez. Minor league contract August 27th. He was let loose by Boston. You wouldn't know that around here from no. the fan reaction just now as he got called to the plate. Some huge hits in his Houston career. He played with the Astros from 2012 to 2018, almost 800 games. And the biggest home run in Astros history? I would say so, huh? 2017 off Kenley Jansen, in game L two of the World Series. In LA. In LA, and Kenley was lights out at that point in his career, untouchable basically. Marwin unfazed. A do it all guy for Houston for many years, showing up to the ball field with sometimes eight gloves in his locker, wherever you want me in the lineup, on the field. He's ready to go with a smile. It reminds you of like a Chris Taylor in LA. I mean, when you have a guy like that, you can deal with injuries much better with other players on your team because as soon as somebody goes down, Marwin can step in and play that position and play it well. Not just fill in, but actually go out there and play the position well. Yeah, plus defense at many spots. Here goes Tucker, and Gonzalez takes off to the Crawford boxes. Forget about it. 
The Astros grab the lead 3-2 off a two-run shot from Marwin Gonzalez. Welcome back to Houston, Marwin. Nice homecoming right there, huh? Oh, that has to feel good. You back with your boys. Having fun. You know everybody in the clubhouse already. And this ball gets a lot of play. Anderson's a guy who needs to be on the corners. He misses over the middle of the plate with this offense. It could get ugly quick. Oh, off the bat he goes. It feels good to be back. That's the thing. Marwin really struggled with the Red Sox. 77 games this season. 202 just two home runs. But you return home to a place you're comfortable with. He might be a big part of this team down the stretch. No doubt about it. Off the bat of Marwin Gonzalez. Here's Maldonado. Base is empty now. Here in the second with two down. Astros now up by a run. One of the huge benefits that Houston has by being so deep with their offense is that it allows a player like Maldonado who's not having the strongest year offensively to be OK and just continue to go out there and work with your starting pitching staff control the game and he calls an amazing game you can't run on him it's a great defensive catcher and very valuable to this team takes his first strike yeah and when you look up at the lineup one through eight you go OK Martin Maldonado does not have to be Salvador Perez for us to be successful. He'll have his days he'll have his highlight days where he comes through in a big situation. But when you're that deep to literally one through eight can beat you in any situation I mean Marma just hit that in the eight hole you just had your eight hole hitter with the big home run to give you the lead back and give Arkady a fresh start. That's with Bregman on the bench. Tyler Anderson tying his shoes and getting ready to face the Astros lineup for the second time. Altuve popped out to shortstop first time around. I mean, that's just not the guy you want to walk. It's not the guy you want to walk. And the, and the last three guys that you faced before that, you had three balls over 100 miles an hour in a row. And that's what happens if you if you miss over the middle. Loud contact from the Astros this inning. Alvarez started it off with the single past the shift. Even Correa with the smash to third into the glove of Seager. With Altuve what makes him so great is that he's so unpredictable on when he's going to be overly aggressive and when he's not. Normally when you see a guy swing at the first pitch of the game that next at bat he would normally take that first pitch. But Altuve knows that and he assumed he was going to get a fastball right there and he was going to try to jump on it jump on it again. So for Anderson it's good that he went with the off speed with the first pitch. <laughs> Veteran move and then in on the hands pop up and out of the inning. But the Astros put up three and they snatched the lead from Seattle. Many thanks to Marwin Gonzalez. Hey Marwin, Houston is home. It's hard the other way. Got a chance. Yes, indeed. Kyle Seeger scores, and the Mariners have a 6 5 lead. And his big hit. And on the ground, base hit. Right field corner. JP walks home. Mitch strolls home. Kyle Seeger, Chuck Ching. 5 3 Seattle. A 1 0 Mariners ball game. Strike three. The Mariners pitch back to back shutouts. High drive right field. Got big time carry. Splash that baby. Three run homer Kyle Seager. 8 5 lead for the Mariners. 
He drills this. Drilled and crushed, and this is gone. Grand Slam. What an at bat. Wonder what the vibe of the clubhouse will be tonight. Four nothing Mariners. Our first YouTube poll is now closed. Don't worry, many more to go, many ways to get involved. But who got the better of the Astros Mariners deadline deal? And it's just been a battle back and forth between Astros and Mariners fans. And the Mariners take it by a 38% count. That's what you went with, right? That's what I went with. Yeah. I think, I think well, the fans made a good call right yeah, there. Yeah, I think so. So does Abraham Taro, and I'm sure so does our next guest. Joining us right now for our YouTube Shorts interview, it's Chris Flexen, who's in the Mariners' dugout. And, Chris, we appreciate the time. Great to have you on. Thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, of course. And we also want to get you involved on the poll, too. Very easy for you to answer this one because we were asking everyone who got the better of the Astros-Mariners deal about a month and change ago. Abraham Taro looks pretty good so far as your new teammate. What do you think? Yeah, he's been phenomenal. You know, he's really uh, <laughs> pulled it together for us and really helped us out big time. Chris, this is Chris Young, man. I love your story. I love the grind that you were able to go through. From, from struggling a couple years before you went over to Korea, what adjustments were you able to make that you were able to bring back here with you? I'd say the biggest thing, you know, I took over in Korea with me was really trying to figure out how to trust myself and continue to be confident and, uh, you know, going through New York and really struggling, you know, really <laughs> disrupted the confidence. But, uh, you know, trying to come in confident this year and was able to get on a nice little roll and uh, have some fun along the way. Does the multi-year deal that you're able to get after the Korea deal kind of ease some of the stress and allow you just to go out there and do your thing? Oh, sure. You know, I mean, that obviously definitely helps. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it comes down to just wanting to get out there and compete and having the opportunity to, you know, go out there and try to make 30 starts and compete every day to help us try to win ball games. Seeger, France, and Toro do up for the Mariners in the third. So Kyle Seeger facing a 3-1 count from Jose Urquidy. He's about to deliver pitch number 50 of his day. And it misses low. Ball four, leadoff walk for the Mariners here in the third. Talking to Chris Flexen and also YouTube creators in the live game commentary section. You know what to do. Any questions you have for Chris, hook us up. We'll relay them over to him. So let's get your thoughts on Tyler Anderson, not just today, but in general this season since joining the ball club. Another trade addition. How has he looked? And evaluate what he does on the mound for us. Yeah, he's a he's interesting. You know, he comes from over the top, comes from the side. You know, throws a throws a four pitch mix. Um, and he's been great for us too. I mean, he's a he's a competitor. You know, every time he takes the ball, he's he's out there competing. You know, that's what uh, that's all you can ask for from these guys. I mean, when you think about all of the pickups the Mariners have made, not just around the trade deadline, but even before the season started. And Chris, you're going to be part of that, and we'll show more in just a second here, as it's Ty France facing a 1-0 count. There are a lot of players that came around here. We can look at the bullpen like Paul Seawald and Sadler and Drew Steckenrider. There are a ton of players that maybe had a journey, some struggles in other spots, and then land here in Seattle and have seen a ton of success in 2021. It's fouled back Just missed by Ty France. This is what I'm talking about. We'll show it on the screen. Flex and Seawald. Raveman, part of the story, these under the radar offseason acquisitions. What are the conversations like, Chris, both when the Mariners are recruiting players to join the team and sign, like you, and then also once you get there? What do you think makes it special? Is there some ingredient that has turned the corner for so many players lately? I just think it's a great group of guys. Um, you know, we get along here pretty well, and uh, you know, it's a fun group. We're always having fun here and, and, uh, and competing in, in, in these ball games. And uh, you know, just like I said, I mean, earlier for me, like just given that opportunity to go out and compete, and it's been fun. It's awesome. And it's working. The Mariners just three games out of a playoff spot right now. Seeger's on after the walk, and then Ty France facing a one-two count. 
and it's upstairs, two and two. All right, so here's our first question from a YouTube creator, Cowboy Jeff. Chris, who was your favorite pitcher growing up? Ooh, so I was born in the Bay Area, and I was actually a huge fan of Matt Cain. Ah, he's in my book, if you were wondering. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I don't. <laughs> he may not be, but uh, he's a, he was a great pitcher. He was a guy who attacked the zone, three pitch guy. Yep. But he's going to use his fastball in and out, yep. and continue to continue to just shove it down your throat. Yep. Good changeup, good slider, and put the little curveball when needed. And you know we're going to make sure we fact check that too, right, Chris? We got to make it's sure so that, that. Yeah. <laughs> just let me have my moment. Yeah. I, even yeah. if it's not true. I'm on the other end of that. Let's let's make sure we fact check that. <laughs> no. It's a no. It's it's a rare miss there. Ooh. Uh, let's pull up my terrible numbers then off of them. Eight for 36. Moment. Eight for 36? Yeah. You, you, you held up. All right. A couple doubles. Tie France down on strikes. There's one gone in the third. All right. Let me bring in another question here. This one from Crash Tag. Hey, Chris, where's your favorite stadium to pitch at when on the road? Ooh, I haven't hit all of them yet. Um, by the end of this year, I think I'll have three left. I think I'm missing Giants, Toronto, and one other one. But favorite one? It's Seattle. Well, that's no, that, on the that, road. Yeah, that's, on the that's, road. That's, that's the home. Yeah. <laughs> home, of course. Got to go. Boston was pretty cool to pitch at. That was my first time this year, and I, I actually had a lot of fun there. It was a pretty chilling experience. Yeah, going with the classic. Fenway's answer. amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was that was pretty awesome for me this year. Do you find yourself in Fenway not coming in on 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 righties or going away from lefties? Did you change the way you pitched in Fenway because of the yard? Uh, no, actually, <laughs> that was actually one of my better outings too. Good. Don't let the park change you. But yeah. some guys did, right, Chris? A lot of guys did. Yeah. I mean, you had hitters who changed their approach because of playing in Boston. I yeah. mean, so, they, I mean, it's definitely a thing, and you know that wall is sitting there, which looks like it's 250 feet away from you. Yeah, exactly. It looks really close. So I can play my, mind games on you. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think Bogart's hit a, a double off the wall off me, and then um, – uh, Devers had a double off the wall too, so it was it was close. But yeah, I mean, I didn't change the way I pitched. I mean, I I was <laughs> I try not to worry about that too much. Like you said, it worked out for you. Yeah, yeah. Seven innings, one run in that outing at Fenway Park for Chris Flexen talking to us now. He picked up the win in that one. It's two balls and two strikes to Abraham Toro. Next question, five point vids. Chris, what's the best nickname you've been given? Ooh. Do you have a nickname? That everyone uses. Uh, flex. Here, yeah, here's just simple. It's just flex. Yeah. Flex is cool though. though. Yeah. Yeah. It's a flex. Yeah, plain and simple flex. I've always had that. Ooh, that's right on top. Get out of here. So, Chris, I'm looking at Baseball Reference, and Big Baby is your listed nickname there. Yeah. So New York gave me that back in 2017, and I was much heavier than I am now, and <laughs> had zero facial hair and still have a baby face but I got a little <laughs> little fuzz coming on right now but yeah so they uh, they looked at me and said you look like an overgrown baby and started calling me big baby <laughs> and then it kind of stuck so but growing out of that one big man now Toro weak lead of first and that's handled by Guriel he'll backtrack and step on the back for out number two well What's the story there? Because I know there was some weight loss overseas. Did you change the diet, work, the diet workout plan? How do you feel the way you do now? Uh, yeah, I feel great now. Um, after my uh, 2018 year, going into 19, I had struggled with some injuries too. And, uh, you know, it was kind of like a career check type thing. Um, you know, and for me, I was, it, was, it was time to make a change. And I, I really committed to it. I, I went from 265 to down to 230. Wow. Uh, that year from 18 into 19. And then in, in Korea, I got uh, as low as uh, 215. I came into this year about 215. And I feel better, you know, feel more agile on the mound. I move better. And 
just able to recover better and just <laughs> a lot more confidence. Yeah, Scott, it's, it's different for every guy. Everybody has a different playing weight that they need to be at, and it doesn't always mean lighter is better. Yeah, no, You have no some doubt. guys who need to be heavier, some guys need to be lighter, but over the years you find out what your happy zone is. Yeah, and, and for me, I, I, I think lighter is better just recovery-wise, and you know, like I said, I, I struggle with some, some injuries as well that I think were uh, weight-related. So then what's the key food? that helped you out also was there a key out in korea that you really loved uh food out in korea i'd say uh like kimchi soup with some ramen was my favorite i mm. think favorite soup all time like the food there was unbelievable um, i had a really good experience out there and really for the weight loss for me was just committing to you know a goal and and uh you know really sticking to it trying to eat just clean and you know a lot of grilled chicken and some steak and a lot of vegetables just really had to just change the way i uh went about it paleo action yeah and i heard the food out there is incredible see why have you been i've never been i've always wanted to go yeah if you if you get the chance i highly recommend it i was in seoul and uh you know it was in the middle of covid too so i didn't get to explore too too much uh especially early on um but yeah, if you ever get the chance to go, I highly recommend it. I, you know, if once, once this COVID thing hopefully blows over soon, and then uh, I'm gonna try to head back out there to Korea and go see everybody in like an off season or something. Yeah, you've got friends out there, and you yeah. can say, hey, what yeah. happened here has really helped me in the big leagues now, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I had a, I had a really good time over there. Well, we're glad you're back here. It looks like you're having a great time. I know it's always a good sign when you're doing an interview and your teammates are throwing sunflower seeds at you. <laughs> so that always tells me it's good chemistry going on. Yeah. So and Jake, the, I think the guys I think JP like was getting me. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like that never gets old. It's always no. great. Yeah. They got to get creative. Yeah, Put you got to. bubble gum. Yeah, do something else, right? Switch I mean, uh, there's only so much available in the dugout. Tell the guys to get creative in there. Switch it up. Do something new. <laughs> Don't throw anything too dangerous. There are no baseball bats yeah, or anything. Nothing too dangerous and nothing cold, right? Yeah, nothing cold, please. Yeah. Save that for walk-offs. Here's Terenz, the one-two, and he stays alive. Seekers on second at the leadoff walk, then strike out, ground ball out, and we're down to the number six hitter for the Mariners, hanging out for another couple minutes here with Chris Flexen, starting pitcher for the Seattle Mariners, hanging out in that dugout. What's the season been like? I mean, this team is right in the thick of a playoff race right now, and it's a young squad. We mentioned some fresh faces. What's the dynamic of the clubhouse and also just the feelings here heading into the final few weeks? It's like you're playing in the playoffs on a daily basis. Yeah, you know, with the schedule we have, too, you know, a lot of a lot of teams that we're chasing as well. Um, no, but it's exciting. You know, we're we're eager to come to the park. You know, we're we're, we're looking to win ball games, win series, and uh, you know, fight for that spot. And uh, you know, it's a lot of fun. Like you said, it's a, it's a young group. We got some veteran guys here that are uh, you know holding it down at the top. But uh, you know, it's 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 primarily a lot of fun. It's fun competing with these guys as well. It seems like when I'm watching, even when I'm listening to you watch the game, it seems like you're in every at bat with your guys out there. So how has it been like everything that you'd imagine to be in a playoff race with a group of young guys, with a few veteran guys that kind of keep everybody, keep everybody cool, calm and collected? Yeah, I think I think as a group, I think we do a pretty good job. Um, you know, for some of us, some of the young guys and including myself, I don't I don't think I've ever really been part of like a playoff push at the major league level. Um, I was never really up there long enough in, in, uh, in New York for that, any of that. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's just just keeping our heads on straight and staying focused on winning ball games, and you know, that's that's all you can focus on. Grind out ABs yeah, too, like yeah. Luis Torrens. Sometimes catcher, sometimes first. A little DH today, and he makes through. contact, and it's gobbled up at third by Marwin. Throws across for the out. Chris, it was awesome talking to you. Yeah, we really enjoyed it. Guys. Good luck the rest of the way, okay? Appreciate that. Take care. Thanks, you Flex. You too. Chris Flex and hanging out with us here in the third. And who but Marwin Gonzalez making his first start back with the Houston Astros. Has the two-run home run in his pocket and a nice play over at third. Astros up by a run mid-three. In the air to left field, back on a Diaz, and he makes a nice diving catch. Diaz to the backhand. Not a natural outfielder, but making a fine play in left field there on the slicing deep fly ball of the bat of Abraham Toro. 
That ball popped in the air. Long run for Bregman. He's the only one that can get there, and he does in pound territory. Alex Bregman, a nice play to end the inning. Strike three called. Runner on the go. That's a strike him out, throw him out, double play. Runner on the go. The throw by Stubbs on the money. How about that? Garrett Stubbs popping out, throwing a seed. Yuli Gurriel hits one high and deep down the left field line, and this ball is gone. Yuli Gurriel, La Pina, cuts the lead in half. It's now a one-run game. Now Carlos Correa swings and sends one deep to center field. That ball's gone. Back-to-back -back jacks, Yuli Gurriel and Carlos Correa. And just like that, the game is tied at three. Two pitches, two bombs. Wow. You're watching the MLB Game of the Week live on YouTube, presented by YouTube Shorts. Watch and create videos on YouTube. Try Shorts in the YouTube app on your phone. And we add to this unique viewing experience. Don't forget to check out YouTube's live game commentary. We've been mixing it in, MLB channel. You have the Astros, the Mariners channels, select group of YouTube creators, and you can view the live game commentary on computer, mobile device, smart TV, anywhere you want to go there. We're keeping an eye on the discussion throughout the game. And that includes questions from our YouTube creators. Hey, I'm talking to all of them right now. Get ready. Lance McCullers Jr. is going to join us soon. First pitch swing and Michael Brantley going to right center. And Mitch Hanninger runs it down for the first out. But McCullers coming soon. He's going to be hanging out with us in the fourth inning. Brantley flies out, and we send it down to Brett Dolan. Hello, Brett. Hey, guys. I keep going back to our pregame meeting with Scott Service. We turned around, and the Mariners were taking infield. And Service said they do this every day from infielders who play every day. This is the last game of a road trip. This is the day game following the night game. It's September. The Mariners are still taking infield, and they take a lot of pride in that. But, guys, I can't believe that's very common among any other team. Yeah, we're all around the game a ton. See why you played double-digit seasons in the bigs. Did you ever do that on a daily basis? Not often, but that's what tells me that these guys, first of all, they're young and they're willing to go out there and get this work in. They're, they're out there on a mission, and they're going out there trying to win games. Normally, after a loss like they had last night, you have the day game after the night game. You want your guys resting normally. But Scott said that getting those guys out there, getting work on defense before the game, although they didn't hit batting practice today, getting their guys up there, it gets them ready for the game, and they come in, they listen to their music, and they're ready to go. It's like a warm-up workout. It's a warm-up, and you need guys, which he emphasized, you need guys like Kyle Seeger to buy in on it because the team goes as Seeger goes. So with them, those two guys able to work together to get the best out of their guys. That's leadership on both ends. Guriel towards the middle, and that's going to drop. And it's a base hit for Yuli. And it's a one-out single for the Astros here in the third. I mean, this Astros offense just continues to put together good at-bats, continues to put the barrel on the ball. Was oh, like, he, 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 wanted, it. he wanted to go. And he's he going wanted back. to go. A few hard steps. <laughs> hey, the 37-year-old can really move. And he can really take pitches now, too. It's incredible to me. One of the better stories in terms of a hitting profile suddenly evolving at such a late, such a late age. I mean, Yuli Gurriel was known as a free swinger, excellent contact man, but not a guy who would take walks. And all of a sudden, he's taking a ton of free passes this year and there was just this natural progression of being around some teammates that take pitches like Carlos Correa and deciding you know what I'll, I'll do what you guys are doing it's almost as if he's always had it in the arsenal and he just decided at age 37 yeah I'm gonna spit out a few more pitches he's always had it and he's a guy that just covers so much of the plate so I think earlier in your career you know you can cover pitches outside of the zone and it keeps you aggressive but sometimes you have to know when to pass the baton and he's learning that with this offense. I mean, you have Alvarez right here behind you. 
He'll, if, he, if they want to walk him, he'll take his walk, and he'll allow Alvarez to come and drive him in. He passed the baton is right when it comes to this Astros lineup. By the way, they're shifting Jordan Alvarez. That's why we have the shift tracker top right of your screen. Show us where the infielders are at all times. Those little dots move along with the players. I'm curious to see if that rule will ever get changed. The shift? The shift. I think it will, and I'm down for it at this point. Two infielders on one side, two on the other. Or keep everyone on the infield dirt. 0 2, cut and a miss. Jordan Alvarez strikes out for the first time today. I'm a supporter of keeping the guys on the dirt. I'm okay if you want to shift, if you want to move around the dirt, but keep infielders on the infield and outfielders on the outfield. And if you want more production in the game, you want more action to happen, I feel like that's a pretty easy, straightforward way to get it done. Remember, the shift didn't work anyway against Jordan for his base hit. Earlier, he eventually scored. That was one inning ago. Astros put up three. Tucker with the RBI double. Two run blast from Marwin Gonzalez in the eight hole. Marwin made a nice play at third base to end the last half inning. And here's the shortstop, Correa. Now, two and up. Talk about the Af Astros offense just a little more. Although it's a runner on first base, two outs, you think normally that's a situation that's a low stress inning. But with this Astros offense, you never get a break, and it always feels like a situation to where somebody could come through big and put a crooked number on the board. And Tucker's been their hottest hitter. He's on deck. And Morales with the consistent strike zone right there. Not giving too much. Forcing Anderson over the plate. And you can tell Anderson may be a little disturbed by that. He wants that call. He needs that call. So right here, just because of the 3-0 count, I don't expect I don't expect the catcher to be set up down the middle. I mean, this is a borderline pitch. It's a good pitch, but it's a ball. But you have a lot of umpires that will call that pitch. And a 3-0 and 2-1 count is two very different situations to be in. And I was right down Broadway. Here's your umpire crew today, Gabe Morales. Calling a nice game behind the plate. You're right. Very consistent so far today. And, I, and I'm a supporter of this. I mean, as a hitter, as a fan of the game, I want strikes to be strikes and balls to be balls. I don't, I don't think it should matter who's on the mound or who's hitting. Because back when I first came into the league, it had a lot to do with what pitcher was on the mound and what, what player was at the plate on what the strike zone would be. You mean Tom Glavin got some calls he shouldn't have? <laughs> Greg Maddox? I'm not saying any names. <laughs> In the air off the bat of Correa to center field, backing up Kelnick. He's got plenty of room. And that will retire the side. Carlos Correa flies out. Nothing for the Astros in the third, but they're hanging on to a 3-2 lead as we head into the fourth. Just smokes it. Forget about it. My goodness. Great baseball right there. And that one's gonna go. That ball was crushed. And this is gonna do it. Up on the mark. Strike three. That was a great play. I talked about his fielding skills. That was remarkable.
Lou Brock was the symbol of great bass stealing. But today, I'm the greatest of all time. Thank you. May 1, 91, Ricky Henderson, epic, classic speech. We'll always remember it. So we mic up players all the time on YouTube on a weekly basis. Which Hall of Famer would you have loved to hear mic'd up for a game? Ricky, Mays, Jackie, Babe. You know we're putting up big names when I only have to say one part of the name. This is actually one of my favorite YouTube poll questions of the year. Get involved right now. Click, press, do whatever you got to do. Touch screen, help us out with the poll answer right now, and we'll pay it off in a little bit. And also, it's super relevant, CY, because today is the Hall of Fame induction ceremony in Cooperstown. Look at the big names heading in, being enshrined. Jeter, Marvin Miller, Ted Simmons, and Larry Walker. That's all happening today in Cooperstown right now. So good luck answering this YouTube poll question. I mean... The only reason I'm going to get involved on in this one, too, the only reason that it was a little easy for me is just based on thinking deeper into the answer on, on who you want to hear. Here's Christian Javier, by the way, taking over for Jose Urquidy. I just like laughs. So for me, it's easy to go with Ricky Henderson because you know he is going to be a walking comedian in the dugout. I want to hear him innings one through nine. But then there's the legends that you want to know. Go for it. They're legends and they're great storytellers. I've been fortunate enough to personally personally know Ricky. I've, I was with Oakland. I talked to Ricky all the time. I personally know Willie Mays. When I would when I would go to play the Giants when I was playing in Arizona, for some reason Willie Mays took a liking to me. And every time I went to San Francisco, he would take me to his house, feed me, show me all of his MVPs, show me his All Stars, show me his Gold Glove trophies. So I've had the opportunity to talk to those guys. So if I had to choose one, I'm choosing Jackie Robinson. And I want to hear those stories. I want to take that history in and, and gain as much knowledge as possible. I mean, you definitely can't go wrong. And that makes sense. Hey, I know a couple of these guys, so I'm going to put them aside because we've spoken before. Because <laughs> I know, didn't you do some work at one point in an offseason or two with Rod Carew? I did. I did. I know Rod, know Rod Carew personally as well. I'll, I, I'll name drop for you. <laughs> <laughs> Jared Kelnick struck out on three pitches. Christian Javier with four strikes so far. There's five. That one is socked center field off the bat of Tom Murphy. But Jake Myers is there. Quickly two up and two down. Javier taking over the 24-year-old. Last pitched in Saturday's 10-4 loss at San Diego. Gave up four runs in the seventh inning, including homers to Machado and Will Myers. Former YouTube player of the game, Christian Javier, earlier nice. this year. We've had the Astros a few times this season. Javier had a dominant performance. I believe it was against the Angels. Am I right? Truck crew. And Dusty got Arquiti out of the game. He had the rough first inning, but he was able to dial it in for the next two innings. For a guy who throws so many strikes, I think the only thing that got him in trouble today was that for those first pitches. He was only 3 of 15 with first pitch strikes, and that, that allowed his pitch count to get up fairly quickly. It was right, too. It was against the Angels. Five shutout innings a while back, a few months ago. The slider's the money pitch for Javier. Opposing hitters are just 110 against it. He's got one of my favorite, I guess, terms for a pitch, the invisible action, which I'll let you explain more than me in a moment. That's off the bat of Jose Marmalejos, deep left field, and it's off the top of the wall. Here comes Jake Myers to retrieve it. It's a two out double for the Mariners nine hitter. That one just kept floating and floating and punched off the Crawford boxes. That left field wall here in Houston and in Boston, it giveth and it taketh away. So I had a lot of times to where a low line drive that I thought would be a home or a lot of places would hit the wall here. But then you have balls like this, those, those late, I'm call it a lazy fly ball to left field. 
that's normally a routine out. But since it's only 315 down that line, it's able to hit the top of that wall and turn into a double. Flip the lineup card back to the leadoff man, J.P. Crawford. There it is. You mentioned Fenway, the wall, the monster, feels very close in left field. Sometimes the Crawford boxes have the same story. It's not as imposing, of course, but it's a good, good spot to target, especially if you're a righty pull hitter. We just got a note from our amazing crew. The expected batting average on that ball right there is 100. <laughs> So I'm assuming it's bringing those two stadiums into play on if that ball should be a hit or not. But if I hit that ball, you better believe I will not feel guilty or bad about it. I'll take that double home with me. It took 11 homers home with you in this ballpark in 33 games, 362 average. I promised everyone in the beginning that I'd mention it. And we're showing you the batting average with two outs and running in, runners in scoring position for Crawford. It's among the AL's finest at 365. Your OPS in this park was over 1,000. And regrettably, I've never had the opportunity to play here. Why not? I always wanted to play here. When I would come here as a visiting team, I would literally have to buy an entire section for my family to come and watch the game, but I love the environment here. I love the stadium. I enjoyed just the visual that I got from this field. It was a great batter's eye in center field. I saw the ball well, and I had a lot of success here. It's not too late. It's not too late. I was gonna say, late. let's run it back. CY they, in Houston. If they call me, I will pick up, I promise. <laughs> you see why at Minute Maid Park, wow. Just take a chance on me. Just give me a shot. So if a YouTube creator asks you where's your favorite road ballpark? Oh, this is four it. misses to Crawford and a two out walk. Now two on for Seattle. This has to be it, right? Based on the fact that it's your hometown and you raked here. You know what? Sometimes it would be slightly stressful coming home because you want to see your family. You want to see everybody when you come in town. But you also want to focus on your game and, and try to and try to go out there and have success but luckily I was a guy I enjoyed that extra pressure I enjoyed the pressure of having my family out there and feeling like I had to do something the one thing your agency did well was say okay Astros moved to the American League we're gonna move CY to the American League too so he can at least continue to hit in this ballpark <laughs> more frequently here's a strike from Javier and it's number two hitter Mitch Hanniger with two on for Seattle Brett, what else do you have for us? Well, I used to interview the post-game player of the game. And back in Chris's time, we would hand these players $50 cash. I think I probably <laughs> contributed about $250, $300 to him for all of his big games here at Minute Maid Park. <laughs> I think it was in the form of a gift card. Maybe Best Buy or something like that. Yeah. That old TV you have. Seattle putting itself in a position to have a big inning right here. Very much so. Christian Javier laboring a bit here. And now facing the meaty part of the order. Hanniger fouls him back. To go back, Scott, to what you said earlier, talking about that invisible ball. I mean, he's a high percentage fastball guy. But you have some guys in the league, they're able to throw a fastball, has that extra backspin on it. It kind of rides up through the zone to where as a hitter, you feel like you're about to put the barrel on it, but it'll just go right over there. And you walk back to the dugout confused, trying to figure out how did that just happen. It's frustrating for those uppercut swings. Hanniger going after the invisible. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Javier. Good little clinic on the pitch. That makes Christian Javier so special along with the slider as he escapes unscathed mid four. Astros up one. Middle of the infield is back. Hoping to turn a double play and conceding the tying run. Corners are in. Altuve drives one deep to left field. Marco, look at it. That's gone. A walk-off slam. Jose Altuve. Are you serious? Wow. 
A walk-off grand slam for Jose Altuve. Wins it in the bottom half of the 10th. Jose drives one deep to left field. LaCastro looks up. You've got to be kidding me. Sixth run, bottom half of the night. Altuve's done it again. A three-run home run for the second time this year against Tad Green. Maybe the most improbable comeback in the major leagues this year. Unbelievable. It is creator spotlight time. We focus on a YouTube content creator featured in our live game commentary section. Today, we shine it on Secret Base. Over 1.1 million subscribers. And Kofi spoke to us on the pregame show. He loves the Mets and gave us a few channel descriptions like the Andy Chavez home run robbery, the 06 NLCS game seven at Shea Stadium. Go subscribe to his channel and see more from Kofi, who is hanging out in the live game commentary section as well. We'll get more from our YouTube creators. Looking for some questions from them for Lance McCullers Jr. when he joins us pretty soon right here on YouTube. 3-2, Astros in front. Last game between these two in the season series. Tyler Anderson matching up against Kyle Tucker and pitching him in tight. It's 1-0, and here's the man himself. Lance McCullers Jr. joining us for this half inning. Our YouTube Shorts interview. Lance, great to talk to you. I don't think we've chatted this year. It's been a minute. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? Doing really well. Watching Kyle Tucker in the sixth spot look like a 2-3 oh. hitter for anyone else. And that one might yeah. hit the top wow. rails. Off it goes. It's uh -oh. twisting. Uh -oh. Oh, oh, and <laughs> that's in fair ground. Kyle Open Tucker trucking for third. Oh. And he is safe. Oh. Well, you don't see that every day. What a way to start the inning. There's your launch angle. What do you think that number's going to look like, Lance? Uh, <laughs> that's going to be somewhere in the 40, 48 range. <laughs> I'll get you that number from the research crew in just a moment. The first person I ever saw hit one off these beams was back in the playoffs of 2015 was Colby Rasmus. Uh, never, no one had ever seen a ball be hit here off the beams, and then all of a sudden, uh, take it for what you want. But after you know, 15, 16, they started hitting them pretty often. I mean, that was truly a moonshot within a, a retractable roof. That's a tougher play than people give it credit for for Hanager. You're running full speed to the line. It looks like the ball almost changes direction. And as you're running full speed to the line, and it's, there's no foul territory up over there, all you see is the wall over there. And as you're running full speed, it's very difficult to gauge when you need to slow down and see that ball have that effect of coming back. I think that's an impossible play, honestly. I don't think, I don't think Hanniger could do much there. We're showing it again. I mean, it looked like it completely changed directions for Mitch Hanniger out there in the right field corner. And then, he grabs the baseball before it could have potentially ended up in the seat. So it actually could have been a ground rule double. Ends up being a leadoff triple for Kyle Tucker. But looks like they're going to review things and make sure that it didn't hit one of those railings. Wow. It, it doesn't look like it hit the railing. Okay. I, I think it's one of those situations if you're Hanniger, you're just running so fast and running out of room so fast that you don't understand that the ball just has a, a falling effect that it, it falls to opposite direction. Similar to what a catcher has to deal with on a very high pop-up. Also, by the way, if it hits the roof in fair territory, it's a fair ball right. when it comes back down. If it's in foul ground, it's a foul ball, but I think this one's gonna stay put. It's under review at the moment. That normally only comes in play in stadiums like Tampa. You don't see that happen here too much, but McCullough says, You've seen it before, right? Seen it a couple of times. Uh, uh, Rafael Devers hit one up there uh, off the beam. Uh, I think it was actually maybe off Brad Peacock. I've seen uh, Colby Rasmus hit a couple up there. Uh, you see some hit up here 
like in the foul ground, uh, right around third base, some big high pop-ups from righties. But the ones out there in, in right field, you, you got to get it uh, really square. Uh, you got to hit it super high. I don't know how high that was, but it, it's, it's definitely a tough one to hit over there. Ready for this launch angle, Lance? 55. 52? 55 oh, my degrees. goodness. Wow. Well, he barreled it. Yeah, he did. He barreled it straight up, and it turned into a triple. Still being reviewed right now by the ump crew. I'm just showing all the replays we have for you. I, I, don't, I don't see know. any change of direction. I think... I don't think, think Hanneker kind of – he may have played it into into that a little bit. They may be reviewing if Hanniger if, – if the fan touched it. Oh, right, which could a, have turned a, it into a, a ground double. roll double. There's so much to look at here. So it wow. seems like they're, they're trying to review if it's a double or a triple pretty much. Also, while we have a moment, YouTube creators will take your questions for Lance when we get a result here. All right, what's the move? Yeah, he's safe and he's safe at third base. All good. Wow. This was the fan portion of it that we're showing right now, Lance, just to make sure. So fan reaches over, but it lands in the glove of Mitch Hanniger. It was a whiff. Good thing for the Astros side, at least, that he didn't grab the baseball because Kyle Tucker gets an extra base out of it. And it's a hit, of course. Can't charge an error against the right not. fielder on that one. Come on. Well, All the glove right. didn't touch it. <laughs> yes. And Jake Myers will now dig in as we hang out with Lance McCullers Jr. Now let's have a normal conversation, Lance, as Myers takes a pitch outside. We have to start with the slider and how it's progressed and how it's been for you. I remember I called your game a couple weeks ago on YouTube, and I was reading about how Brent Strom and company and the pitching staff or the pitching coaches said, hey, let's take it easy on the slider. This was in the beginning of the season. Let's see how it looks. Um, now they're like, yeah, use it however you'd like, Lance. This has become such a weapon for you. Can you tell us the progression? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's something that I've been wanting to throw for, for a couple years. Uh, I just hadn't really you know, committed to it early uh, in camp in order to get those reps. You know, last year I felt uh, in, in, the, in that ALCS, gave up a couple homers on some pitches that I thought some good curveballs, but it really – it really kind of made me feel like I just needed to mix it up a little bit, especially to the righties um, with the way that my, my pitch groups kind of look now. So the slider, um, you know, kind of mirroring, you know, off the two seam, off the change up, it just it gives me the ability to attack the zone behind an account. Um, and even when I'm ahead, you know, 0-2, oh, 1-2, two, two, I don't really have to try to do too much. I can challenge guys in the zone, you know, get, get good results, try to go deeper in the game. So it, it's become a pitch I feel very comfortable throwing. Um, you know, Seattle, they, they're trying to stack the lefties against me. Uh, last couple of starts, they, they, don't, they don't want much to do with the slider, but, um, you know, it's been good. Uh, it, it's been a really, really big weapon for me. It's helped me out this year a lot. Does the slider have a name yet for the national audience? Because it, the curveball is the Snapdragon, right? Yeah, me and Colin McHugh, we, we had like a little joke back in the day. Um, that was just what we called, you know, kind of curveballs in general. We kind of yell from the dugout, um, you know, or like throw the banger or something like that. So, no, no, no official name yet. Colin throws a very similar pitch. Um, it's absolutely disgusting. You know, you guys see what he's doing with Tampa Bay this year, having a fantastic year. So when he, they come here late, late September, we'll have to have a, a formal discussion and see what we can come up with. <laughs> I like that. Lance, Chris Young here, man. You were a guy that when I was on the opposite team, I always loved being on the team going against you. And I was curious, just like I have you now, so we might as well dig into it a little bit. How familiar are you with your pitch percentages and your numbers as you're going throughout a season? Because we would have scouting reports on you, and we would say, okay, anytime this guy is in a hitter's count, you're going to get a breaking ball, so sell out for the breaking ball. And we would face you that day, and in those situations, you would throw us off fastballs, and you would continue to flip-flop throughout the season to keep us on our toes, or keep us on our heels, sorry. How aware are you of your numbers and how much are you studying that and knowing how the other team is approaching you when you pitch? Yeah, I think, you know, in this day and age especially, there's just there's just so much information for, for both sides, right, for pitchers included. Um, you know, you just try to, you try to, you know, keep the other team guessing. Obviously, there's there's no there's no mystery, you know, I, especially if you're a lefty, I'm going to throw you, you're going to throw you a good amount of breaking balls. Now, if you're a righty, you know, you're, you're going to get some sliders, but uh, there will be games, especially if I'm feeling good with, you know, the change up. I can throw the change up, you know, 20, 25% of the time, which definitely would throw a wrench uh, in, a, in a team's plan. 
Uh, and, and I've added the cutter, uh, especially for lefties, kind of up, try to stretch that zone out a little bit. Marwin Gonzalez bounces out, infield drawn in, now two down with Tucker at third. We try to stretch that zone a little bit just because, you know, as a lefty, you know, basically I'm on the front rail with the two seam. If you see it out over the plate, you're, you're, you're kind of expecting more change up, maybe breaking ball. So the cutter up and away right around that, you know, 89 to 91. So there's things that I tried throughout the season. I added the cutter late last year, felt like I wasn't getting the, uh, the looks I wanted from lefties. And if I do face a team, you know, and I feel like, oh, you know, this, this is the game plan. You know, we can, you know, we, we'll flip it. The other day I was facing, um, I was facing, you know, Ty France. He's been having a fantastic season with, with men in scoring position, um, you know, and, and, and attacked him with some backdoor twos. That felt like the slider was something he was looking for. Lance does his homework, that's for sure. That's a comebacker and a really nice recovery from Tyler Anderson after the leadoff. Wacky triple from Kyle Tucker. Lance, always a pleasure. Really fun talking to you. Good luck the rest of the way. We'll talk soon, okay? All right, guys, thanks. Thanks, Lance. Lance McCullers Jr., great combo, great game prepper, and one of the best on the mound. It's 3-2. His Astros lead it after four. Come on, Chance. Whether he's rescuing homeless animals through his foundation Yay! or working with at-risk young people through Big Brothers Big Sisters, Lance McCullers Jr. is driven by a phrase he's driven by a thousand times. There's a bridge or a train track in Houston, and it's painted on there. Uh, be someone and it's just become a staple of Houston and a core value of McCullers. He now has a be someone tattoo on his arm just below the astronaut World Series trophy and Houston skyline. That little area of my arm um, is dedicated to the city of Houston and uh, just a daily reminder to uh, try to be your best self. We have already hit our hundred thousand dollar goal. More often than not when McCullers is giving back a company that invented one of the most unique baseball-related products is supporting him. Dugout Mugs makes customized baseball bat drinking mugs. Any time that uh, a mug of mine is bought, any time a mug of one of our affiliates is bought, um, they're always donating back proceeds uh, to our foundation. Hey, the first year tradition continues. We've given our viewers the power to vote for which standout performer is going to receive the U2 Player of the Game trophy. And stay tuned. Later on, we'll have polling options, and you'll be able to help us hand out some hardware in the post-game show immediately after the contest comes to a close. Last week, the man on the mound for the Giants, Logan Webb, did the trick. And we'll do that later. Let's finish up this poll question, one of my favorites on the season. Which Hall of Famer would you have loved to hear mic'd up? In a game, Babe Ruth wins it. This was just an ultimate clash of four legends. Ricky, Mays, Jackie, Babe. You can't go wrong here, first off. You can't go wrong. I mean, it's going to be a lot of history no matter who, you're, who, you're, who you see out there. But Babe Ruth is going to have some great stories. Oh, yeah. From back in the days. Back, back, back. Way back. It's in the dirt from Christian Javier as we start off the fifth inning with Seeger, then France and Toro for Seattle trailing by a run. Seeger with an infield single and a walk his second time up. He scored back in the first. We also had four very different personalities. Not that I know any of them. You do. You don't know Babe. I don't know Babe. We hear stories. And I'm sure on certain days, Babe was very entertaining. And Ricky tells some great stories, too. And the fact that you're talking in third person for an entire <laughs> conversation doesn't get much better than that. That's really what sold it for me. Ricky would be narrating, and he would play to the YouTube crowd, I think, too. Oh, see, this is what Ricky would do in this situation. <laughs> Yeah. Ricky would have stole that base. Ricky would have stole second, and then Ricky would have stole third as well if Ricky didn't go deep. But Ricky probably would have went deep. <laughs> That's what I was looking for. Seeger lays off the 2-1. It's 3-1. and one.
Kyle Seager's only hitting 212, but he's up to 34 home runs this season, 18 of them in the second half of the year. And he walks for the second time in a row. Statcast powered by Google Cloud. This is just going to help tell a very simple story for us. Kyle Seeger likes to pull the baseball for his power. 28 pulled home runs, fourth most in Major League Baseball. You see the one opposite, and then a few to center field, and the rest are going to right. And I'm okay with that as a player, because what that tells me is that he knows what his approach is. is. He knows the caliber player he is, and he knows how he's going to be the most successful at the plate. And some guys, if they go up there trying to hit the ball the other way, on the if he goes up there trying to hit singles down the left field line, he may lose that strength. So he's going to go out there, understand his strength, and try to pull the ball out the yard. And it's turned into a career power year. This man at the play type, France, is having a career season offensively. Brett Dolan, what else can you tell us? Well, he got the opposite field base hit back in the first inning. And Scott Service told us before the game, he uses the whole field as good as any right-handed hitter he has seen in quite some time. CY brought up playing for Tony Gwynn at San Diego State. He got one year with Tony before he passed away. Gwynn used to give him a decal of a bat to put on the back of his helmet every time he had an opposite field base hit. You see his numbers, what he has done this year. He's been fantastic in the second half. You wonder if that thought that training from Tony Gwynn sticks with him today. And even when you go back to a couple of years ago, another Gwynn parallel, when France got called up mid-August from San Diego to San Diego from El Paso, he was hitting 399. Nobody had hit 400 in the PCL since 1933. I'm sure he was glad to be in the big leagues. He probably would have wanted one more hit. And you think of the last guy in the big leagues to chase 400. Really, it was Tony Gwynn in 94. Didn't get to finish his season either because of the strike. Had to settle for 394. So some fun parallels there with Tony Gwynn and Ty France. Yeah, that's great stuff, Brett. And I actually called the AAA All-Star game that year. I was doing my homework, and I got way away. I know that there's some big-time numbers in AAA this season. This was a few years ago, but I'm like, is he really hitting 399? Who is this guy? And he was barely receiving any attention. He's a guy, which one of one of my favorite types of players is a big guy who just goes out there and he's just trying to get hits. Because what this tells me is that he's going to develop that power. I mean, he has 15, 16 home runs, but that power will continue to rise. But as long as he continues to get his hits, he'll learn how to introduce that power to the game and know when to go to that, when, when to go to the well to try to hit the ball out of the yard. But majority of the time, just taking your hit is what your team needs. Chasing some high cheese. He's whiffed a couple times today. Pretty rare two strikeout day for Ty France. He did have the base hit in the first, so he's one for three. Abraham Toro is one for two and hits the first pitch the other way. Left center field, Myers chasing it, and he's got the baseball. Now heading back to first, and in there safely is Kyle Seeger. Jake Myers with the closing speed. Wow, what a catch. What a great play. And normally to the naked eye, you're assuming that's the left fielder's ball right there. But with all those little cutouts that you have here at Minute Maid Park, you need one person to take charge. Myers probably called that ball early, understood that he had the freedom to not collide with the left fielder. They have that trust out there amongst outfielders. And he trusts that he can go out there and make that play. He stumbled too, and then kind of disappeared on us. But he's got it. That is a gutsy play. And this is where StatCast really helps us out. Catch probability, percentage chance on a ball hit that way in terms of exit velocity, launch angle. How many times does it get caught? 10% of the time. Now, he stumbled. He didn't dive or anything. But that is an elite catch out there in center field. That jut out of the wall right there is very scary when you're a center fielder running directly at it. That ball was five feet to the right. It's probably a double off the wall. It went 106 feet. Sprint speed at 29.5. It's a very elite mark for Jake Myers to cover the ground. And this goes back to the discussion of Who's going to be your guy in center field for the postseason? It was Miles Straw for portions of this season. He was traded away to Cleveland. It's Chaz McCormick and Jake Myers out there lately, but manager Dusty Baker told us this morning there's more experience for Myers in center. 
And so that could help make the difference, especially when you think about postseason baseball and defense is amplified there. Dusty said that he has more experience in center field. He hits lefty slightly better. McCormick has the edge on the power. But when you have two guys who are hitting very comparable, I feel like in the playoff situation, you're going to you're going to naturally lean towards who's going to play the better defense out there. Because when the playoffs come around, pitching and defense, as everybody knows, is what wins your games for you. That's above average measures D. Astros best in baseball. Clearly defense matters to this team. They have the formula. Trying to get those 27 outs as fast as possible and as efficient as possible. On a hop for Correa to step on the bag go the short way and retire the side after the leadoff walk for Kyle Seager. Some good pitching and some strong defense in center from the rookie. Mid five Astros still up three two. We're in the home fifth. Astros lead at 3 2. Dusty Baker is inching closer and closer to this exclusive club. He's at 1,973 wins, but you need 2,000 to get through the bouncer. See why? I, I don't know much about it, but this is a little sneak peek at the 2,000 win club. Some dress fancy, some are in their game uniforms, but every conversation is legendary. Everyone is legendary, and Dusty. Having a great season here at the Astros. I was so happy to see him get another opportunity to manage. At 72 years old, he's not the norm in today's game. You don't normally see these veteran guys still managing ball games. And especially from coming from A.J. Hinch to Dusty Baker, those are two guys that work very different ways. Dusty Baker is just the ultimate player's manager. He's been here forever. He's done it for a long time. He earns the trust of his players right away. As soon as he walks into the room, if you're a player, when Dusty speaks, you listen. And at 72 years old, I'm happy to see him getting this opportunity. He's going to get the 2,000 wins, and I think he definitely belongs in the Hall of Fame. He wants a World Series title as a manager. Still going after that mark to solidify the Hall of Fame case. Fifth oldest manager in Major League history. And most wins without a World Series. There it is. 1,973 games. Incredible. And he's had some pretty good teams as well. He managed a talented Washington Nationals ball club, Chicago Cubs back in the day. Right now, this Astros team is super strong in every category. Altuve, the leadoff man, homered yesterday. 2-1 is ripped. Left field, does he have it on back-to-back -back days? He does! Jose Altuve didn't homer for about a month. Goes long yesterday and doubles up this afternoon. It's number 27 on the season. Make it 4-2, Houston. Never get a break. Altuve, who is known to pull the ball now. He's going up there every time, 
knowing that he's trying to pull the ball. He's not the same hitter that he was years ago trying to hit the ball the other way. He's trying to expose his power. You heard Scott, 27 home runs. He's going up there trying to do damage. And he's able to, able to drive it out the yard right there. Probably 316 feet, <laughs> I would say. That's all he needed. That is only a home run in one stadium in the major leagues. I'm not just saying that. There's statistics to back that up. Yeah, that's not a homer in Boston. That nope. could potentially be a single in Boston, believe it or not, if the left fielder knows how to play it off the wall. But it's not about how far it goes. It's just a matter that it gets up out of there. First row Crawford boxes. Homer for Altuve, and now a roller for Abraham Toro to clean up. First out in the fifth. Back to Dusty Baker for a moment. Who's loving this? I would say veteran group. There's been a core there for a while for Houston. Five teams managed by Dusty in 24 seasons. Three-time manager of the year. Had a really good-looking San Francisco Giants team that made it to the World Series. And he's just been not only a smooth, experienced voice, in the clubhouse, but really in a strong ambassador for the ball club. As Yuli Gurriel takes the 1 0, it's 2 0. He, he's one of those managers to where, as a player, you're able to gain that trust right away because you know that he's going to tell you exactly how it is. If you're not his guy, he, he's going to let you know, hey, you have to earn this spot. Or if you are his guy, he's going to look out for you and he's going to put you out there no matter what. If you have some struggles, he's going to stick with you because he understands that for us to win, you have to go. I mean, clearly, he's managed some very good ball clubs, been to the postseason multiple times. The World Series, I think at that point, is just a coincidence. It doesn't mean that you can't manage in this situation. It's just pure coincidence that it's just really hard to win a World Series. Yeah. And everything has to work out, and everybody has to be hot at the right time. And if that doesn't happen, you don't win the World Series. It's just part of the game. Four pitch base on balls for Yuli Gurriel. The number three hitter is on board with one out in the fifth. And this copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the Office of the Commissioner of Baseball. It may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form, and the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without express written consent. Now Jordan Alvarez, one out, one on, and a run in for the Astros on the Altuve homer here in the fifth. I mentioned ambassador for Dusty too for this team because they had to weather the storm of the sign stealing scandal from a couple years ago. And you know he had to deal with a lot of those questions when he wasn't here. Alvarez is a foul ball, hooked to the right side. Another hard hit baseball off the bat of the Astros cleanup hitter, but Dusty is just a guy who had the right answers at the right time for this team to kind of help them get through things. And even last year, we went over some of the adversity that they dealt with. They were one win away from the World Series oh, with no, Dusty bad year. running the ship. That's a bad <laughs> year in Houston. This team has been on some run for a long time now. And I'm, I'm very curious to see what Dusty decides to do after this year, what the Astros decide to do with Dusty Baker, how many more years will he get the opportunity to manage, or, or will he walk away? How many years does he want to manage still? And he says he wants to keep rolling. Great ball club to lead. Runners going. Pitch is hit hard off the bat of Alvarez, but uh -oh, we got a play. right to Hanniger, and he's coming uh -huh. for first, and he's going to miss him. Ty France looks like didn't nail the tag down on Yuli Gurriel. So just one out. But a good try there by Hanniger, who has an excellent arm in right field. Great job by Guriel keeping his head on the swivel. You're trying to steal that base, but he peeked in at the right time. Right here, you'll see, you see he peeks, he sees that fly ball. But, oh, I gotta get back. <laughs> and luckily the throw was just a little bit up the baseline. He's able to get back and just evade the tag barely. Look at this avoidance by Uli Guriel. Don't touch me. Uniform, it's a good cleaning now. 
That's what you want. Yeah. That's what you want as a player. You got to get dirty. There was a lot of discussion earlier in the live game commentary about the Mariners uniforms. Sports Gaming Universe said these Mariners all jerseys have to be one of my all time favorites in MLB makes me think of Griffey Jr. And then when they had some success later on Andy Rulo said that's the magic of the Northwest green jerseys. I love them. What's that teal? For getting fancy. It's just classic. I love it. Yeah. It does remind you of Griffey though. That's a great point. Reminds you of the kid out there with his hat backwards. Coolest customer in Coolest the big leagues customer. for what? Almost a couple decades. This Mariners ball club trying to get back to the playoffs for the first time since 2001. They're three games away from a playoff spot, that second wild card seed entering the day. Houston at 81 and 57, six and a half games up now on second place Seattle in the division. Tyler Anderson at 73 pitches. Is he going to pick on Yuli again? Nope, he's going home. And it's a foul ball. So hopefully I don't jinx Anderson right here. But he's a guy that goes a little bit against the grain of today's game, which is something that Odorizzi ran into in yesterday's game. And that third time around the lineup, OPS doesn't go up against him. He's able to get through the, road, get through the lineup three times and guys consistently be around the same numbers as opposed to Odorizzi yesterday, which there was a little conflict after the game because he was pulled after only 60 something pitches or whatever it was. It wasn't a lot of pitches. He felt like he 66 should stay in the game. pitches. Yeah, yeah five 66 innings, pitches. two runs. And he said, I'm glad we won. If not, I'd be the subject of blame. Basically said 66 pitches through five. There's not much else to say. I was trying to infer that he should have pitched longer in that one. He's a veteran on the mound, but he voiced his opinion strongly after the game. And eventually he chatted with the front office and with the coaching staff to kind of clear things up. But these are kind of like playoff games right now. It's the last game of the season between these two. And look at Carlos Correa connect into right field. Two out single. Astros in business here now in the fifth with Kyle Tucker coming up. He's two for two today with a double and a triple. Quick visit. I see they do have somebody up in the bullpen. You I said mean, I don't want to jinx him. I don't want to jinx him. I thought about not saying it because every time you say something, it comes back <laughs> and bites you. But because of his track record, because of the numbers saying that he can get through the lineup three times, that's how he's earned this opportunity to get out of trouble right here and still try to find a way to get, him, get himself a win. Sometimes Carlos Correa has struggled to stay on the field. You can see this is just his second season at 120 plus games. But when he's on the field, he's been super productive. Last year was a down season, but it was a shortened season. Many stars struggled in limited time, but it's a perfect year to have a platform season for Carlos Correa. And it's not just what he does at the plate. He is having a super year on defense, too, and the metrics back that up. There's Casey Sadler getting hot. Big test for Tyler Anderson. He's only at 76 pitches, and he's given the M's at least five innings in each start that he's made since joining the ball club via trade. The only dangerous part here with Tucker that he's hit the ball hard two times. He's sitting with a double and a triple already. Obviously, he sees Anderson really well. So that's the only thing that could potentially change this decision when, when your service trying to decide if I'm going to allow him to face him in this situation or not. You have your lefty-lefty matchup. It's 2-0. and oh. Close to hitting the hands of Kyle Tucker. And a lot of times lefty lefty matchup or righty righty matchup matters when you're when you're trying to make this decision. But you also have to look at the previous at bats and understand how this guy is seeing the ball off of this pitcher. And, and both Tucker. balls were 100 plus miles an hour off the bat for Tucker. <laughs> well that happens all the time. Now three and zero. Oh. And Anderson knows. 
He knows that stat you just said. He may yeah. not know the exact number, but he knows it was two missiles off of this guy's bat. And, and I can't just come across the middle of the plate right here. I need to nibble. Even in this 3-0 count, I'm saying he's not trying to throw a cookie down the middle. You'll, you'll still see the catcher set up on the corner right here, trying to execute a pitch, hope that he expands his zone a little bit. He's one of the best control artists in the game. The 3-0 is a little up and I don't think I mean I know he wanted that call but I don't think he needs yeah and here comes Scott service I don't think he needs to deal with Kyle Tucker with the production that he's had against him sinker maybe just missed up according to Gabe Morales here comes Scott service do you like this call though and I ask that because and there's the pitch from Statcast. Jake Myers is on deck. Jake Myers 0 for 2, a couple strikeouts swinging. I thought Anderson would hang around here to try and get himself out of the inning. This is actually going to be the first time in 27 starts for Tyler Anderson that he doesn't go at least five innings. So he is clearly frustrated. Sadler's going to try and clean up this mess in the fifth. Google Cloud is helping to power StatCast with massive amounts of data points to reveal new insights, taking you deeper into the game than ever before. Google Cloud is the official cloud technology of Major League Baseball. And StatCast powered by Google Cloud had to do a lot of work here. And follow this baseball from Kyle Tucker. Not to the seats, to the roof. 55 degrees on the launch angle. It was in the air for 6.8 seconds. At one point, we're like, is it coming back? That hurts. You have seven seconds to make, to make the play right there. <laughs> and Mitch Haniger just couldn't find it in right field. Now the bases are loaded for Houston. Key spot in the game, Tyler Anderson removed for Casey Sadler, who you can see has been lights out in his 30 appearances this year. ERA a few shades below one on the season, one of those Gem finds for the front office. So he's really turned his career around. This is his fourth organization since 2018, and by far his best season of his career. Although this guy is statistically the best in the league, and this is the guy that you would bring into a situation because although it's the fifth inning, this could be the inning that determines who wins and loses this game, depending on if he gets out of here. But if you're Jake Myers, I think you're okay seeing Sattler right here. After two strikeouts in the first couple at bats against Anderson, you're looking for a different look. And Myers does take off, gives that one a ride to deep center field, but Kelnick is there. So it all worked out for Scott Service. Pulls the plug on Tyler Anderson, goes with his super strong bullpen, but the Astros do add a little insurance here in the fifth. Number 27 for number 27. That's what Healy Six said in the live game commentary. Watching it all globally today on YouTube. Astros going for the sweep, doubling up the M's 4-2.
Batazo alto, profundo, hacia atrás, hacia atrás. Marineros ganan el partido esta noche. Doblete de Ty Friends. Vaya, anda para allá, Marineros, con la victoria. 6 a 5. Swing a high fly ball in the right field, playable. Hanniger comes in. It's Toro drifting out. The Mariners' second baseman is unable to make. Oh, he made the catch! He lost it. It popped in the air like a snowball, and then he made the catch again. One out, base is loaded. Pitch number eight to Toro. He drills this. Drilled and crossed, and this is gone. Grand slam. We're in the sixth. Great ball game today between the Mariners and Astros. And we're checking out the notable free agent class of shortstops coming up in the offseason. Avi Baez, Carlos Correa, Corey Seager, Marcus Simeon is playing second base for the Blue Jays, but he can certainly handle shortstop. And then Trevor Story on this list. Francisco Lindor would have been a free agent, but the Mets lock him up to a long-term deal right before the season started. So our next poll question has to do with that after this pitch here from Christian Javier. Misses down to Jared Kelnick, who made the last out in the last half inning. Which free agent shortstop is most likely on the move, changing teams this offseason? Baez Correa, show you more in a sec, as that's a little bloop shot over third, and it's a seeing eye single for Jared Kelnick to start the sixth. Back to the poll question for everyone. Start voting, please. We'll get the answer from CY, what he thinks in a moment. Who's most likely on the move? Baez Correa, Seeger story. I'm going to go wild here and say, and it's not an option. We're looking for most likely, but I think all four change teams in the offseason. What about you? I think all four could definitely change teams. I mean, I saw some recent statements from Correa to where, you know, he doesn't know if he's going to be here or not. If I had to choose one guy that will be moving, I'm assuming Seager will be moving around with the signing of Trey Turner with so many versatile guys in that Dodgers offense. I, I don't think the Dodgers are going to go over the top to try to keep Seager. And I think there's another team that would be willing to pay up to get him to leave L.A. Do you think he's the most likely, even more so than Trevor Story, who's on the Rockies, who's going to be a free agent? I think there's a better chance that he latches back with the team that he's playing with right now? Yeah, I think Seager's my guy. Okay. I'm going to stick with my gut on this one, although they both can be moved. But I still think Seager's the guy that's going to most likely be moved. Seattle well, is going to have some money to spend, too. Maybe they land one of these shortstops. Let me run it back. Uh-oh. Some of the drama that Baez has had in Thank New York. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everybody. Baez is probably going to make a move unless he finds a way to rekindle <laughs> rekindle that relationship over there in New York. Yeah, I'm going to give a thumbs down to him returning to the Mets this offseason. 0-2 misses up and in to Tom Murphy, number eight hitter. That's why I'm looking at that list. I'm going, it's actually a good question because I think they all could be moving. So which one is most likely? If you're banking on one, it's definitely not going to be with the same ball club that he's with right now. What's your pick? Vote, and we'll show the results later. Brooks Raley could be next for Houston after Javier. Short day for Jose Urquidy. He's still coming off the shoulder injury in the middle of the season. He missed a good chunk of time. Urquidy making just his second start off the IL. Only going three innings, 70 pitches. Now Javier taking over for some long work. Having a weapon like Javier who's able to come in, he can throw a lot of fastballs. To come in and relieve Urquidy and give you some quality innings in the middle of the game, that's so valuable for that bullpen and allowing the guys at the back end to stay in their in, the, in their you know in the role that you want to see them in. Yeah do it all guy. 
the flex position he can start to. He's made nine starts. Big swing and miss. Pitcher on the mound, Christian Javier. Two scoreless so far today. Two hits, three strikeouts, a couple walks. Last year finished in third place in AL Rookie of the Year voting. Well, Brett, the Astros can swing the bat. They don't miss much. They play great defense. And the pitching just hasn't skipped a beat, even though there's no more Cole, there's no more Verlander. They just pump out arms in this organization. Well, there's no doubt about it. And I think Brent Strom is a guy that we know about. Maybe we don't give him the full credit on what he has done since 2015. You talk about where the Astros rank third in the majors and earned run average since 2015, second in whip, first in opponents' OPS. The Dodgers lead all the categories, but there's a big difference between pitching at Chavez Ravine and Minute Maid Park. You mentioned Cole gone a couple of years ago. Verlander hasn't been a factor. But Brent Strom finds a way to get it done. His philosophy of high fastballs, curveball usage, use all the quadrants. It's been very successful. And he came here with Jeff Luno and A.J. Hinch. He's still here with James Click and Dusty Baker, and that's obviously for a reason. He's a big part of what they do pitching-wise. He's a staple in this organization. He was into pitching up in the zone before it was cool. Back when it was, you know, sinkers down, slider down, get those ground balls. Here's a fly ball off the bat of Marmalejos. In foul territory is Guriel for the catch and the first out here in the sixth. But Brent Strom always believed in using the arsenal up in the zone, and it really is in vogue nowadays. You have some teams that just understand the pitching philosophy. I mean, you see the Astros and the White Sox. Granted, they have really good pitchers, but they have a plan and an approach on how to attack an offense, and it's proven to be to to work. And they're going to work with their next man on the mound, Brooks Raley. Dusty Baker takes the ball from Christian Javier. Two on for Seattle here in the sixth. Raley coming in. Right now, the Mariners looking for the tie. They would take a fly ball. They would love a base hit into the gap, and they could win it with junior speed. Everybody's going to be straight away. Edgar sprays it all over. All right, ball hit right center. I can definitely go first to third. Left center, first to third. Left field line is a little softer. If it stays down there, I can go from first to home. It's my field, so I know home field. So here it is. I score easy. I turn around, you know, to see where Junior was. He was flying. Never seen him run that fast before. Here is Junior to third base. They're going to wave him in. My wife goes, I didn't know you could run that fast. I go, shh, I ain't supposed to show that all the time. Rivalry is certainly heating up, but it's been lopsided for the last few seasons. Astros, 36 wins, just 11 losses against the Mariners since the start of 2019. It's the second most dominance we've seen from one division opponent against another in the last few years. Only Cleveland pouncing on the Tigers has shown us more dominance, and that continues this week at least. But like I mentioned, Seattle's played much better against them this season. Really go back to 2019. The Astros were 18 and one that year against Seattle. Last year seven and three, and this year 11 and seven at the moment. Thinking sweep today, leading four to two, with Brooks Raley, the 33-year-old left-hander, taking over for Dusty Baker's Houston Astros ball club, going up against Scott Service and a surging Seattle team that they hope has their best years ahead of them. One of the top farm systems in the sport as well. 
and just three games away from a playoff spot. Top of the order, J.P. Crawford, two on, one out, here in the visiting sixth. There's Rayleigh's numbers, not pretty. ERA in the five and a half range. And he last pitched in San Diego on Sunday. Picked up the last out of the sixth inning, which actually was a caught stealing, so only four tosses in that one. He's another kitchen sink guy. Cutter, slider, sinker, curve, four seamer. He can pretty much throw everything, but he still gets in trouble with that cutter and sinker with hitters hitting over 300 off of those pitches. Okay, so with Kelnick reaching on the single, Murphy walking, and number nine hitter, Jose Marmalejos, the last man out. If CY was managing, this is always a tough situation <laughs> for me. So as Marmalejos is coming to the plate, I'm assuming you got a runner on first and second, no outs. You're hitting the nine hole. You're scuffling a little bit. Is this a situation that you would put a bunt down? And normally you would say yes. And I think, you know, the manager has to be thinking about that. But the problem is that he hasn't bunted at all this year. And in his pro career. He's never had a bunt. That was the only thing I'm thinking as J.P. Crawford strikes out. Nice pitch from Raley. It's tipped into the glove. But Marmalejos has done some serious damage in the minor leagues. Hasn't converted really much into the majors. But I was thinking, has he bunted much in his life? And the answer is no. That's why I personally believe you need to continue to work on that through the minor leagues. Even if you're the star on your minor league team, you don't know what your role is going to be when you get talk, caught up to the big leagues, just because you're in the three, four, five hole in double A doesn't necessarily mean when you get to the big leagues and you're in a big league lineup that you're going to be that middle of the or order guy. And as a manager, I think Scott is hoping that if he gets in that situation, he can he can call it because you don't want to waste in that bat and call a bunt if a guy has never bunted before. But you would be nice to be able to have that weapon. You're down by two runs with a guy scuffling with the bat to be able to get those runner, runners over and give Crawford a different mindset as he's going to the plate with the runner on third base with less than two outs. But as a whole, the Mariners don't bunt. I mean, they have eight sack bunts this season, which is the fourth fewest in the majors. And I know bunting is a lost art, but at some times when I'm watching a game, it just seems like the right play. Mm -hmm. And guy and teams rarely go to it anymore. So the Mariners did it last night in the top of the tenth. Didn't work out for Dylan Moore. Mariners come up empty in that inning, and then the Astros walked them off. But you're right, I mean, Seattle and Houston are in the bottom four in bunts in baseball this year. And something else that could go into that decision is how well they normally hit with runners in scoring position. Hanniger bounces out. Look at Brooks, Brooks Raley come in and pick up two outs. Strike out, ground ball. And the Seattle Mariners strand two here in the sixth and still have just two from that first inning. this time in the game that Mr. Kyle is extremely aware of the fact that there's a major zero in that hit column. There's a line drive. Nice play by Tim and Eddie. He throws anyways. It was caught on the line, so Tim and are gone. Long ball is short. So Daniel Long Got him! There's the drama right there. You see that zero? No hits for the Mets. Third ball, one hopper to the shortstop, Sedeno to first, and Powell is two outs away from a no-no. 2-2 -no. pitch. Strike three. A one 2 pitch. Schwinger and this strike three, a no-hitter for Daryl Powell.
Hey, listen to MLB's podcasts to hear the latest analysis from insiders across the league and exclusive in-depth interviews with baseball's biggest stars. Subscribe now at MLB.com slash podcasts. The MLB Ballpark app will complete your next visit to the ballpark. Buy and manage game tickets, redeem offers, access exclusive content, and much more. Download the Ballpark app today. It's hot outside in Houston, but guess what? This ballpark has a lid on it, and it helps. <laughs> Orbit is very thankful for the climate control, as you can see. He's one of my favorites, by the way. I'm saying there's still a heavy sweat happening under, under, that, <laughs> yes. under that suit right now. Orbit's like the new school Philly fanatic for me. Similar personality, but has some modern tricks. So does Joe Smith. He's been fooling hitters for years. He's 37 years old, has one of those unique arm angles that gives you a completely different look out of the bullpen. He's pitched better with Seattle since moving over in that highly publicized trade that featured Abraham Toro and Kendall Graveman. Smith now against his former ball club here in Houston in the sixth. And like you said, he's another guy who has benefited from the change in scenery. With over C seven ERA with Houston, he's able to come over here to Seattle, get a fresh start, and have an ERA in the low twos. He's always had that funky arm angle, sinker slider guy. He's a guy whose slider was always very effective in the past, but this year it's been getting hit a little bit, and that's what caused the issues with the, his ERA over with Houston. Matching up with his former teammate, Marwin Gonzalez. Marwin homered in the second. When you're coming from a sidearm angle with that slider, you literally need that ball for Marwin. You literally need that ball to start well off the plate to come back over the middle. If it starts on the outside corner, by the time it gets to you, that's in off the plate. And it's always tough to gauge that as a hitter on where this ball needs to start when you have a reliever coming in with a completely different arm angle from the guy you pit, you faced before. You faced him two for seven. It wasn't comfortable though. No. Didn't look like Marwin was comfy there. Skied. And caught. One out in the sixth. That's Cal Raleigh, the rookie with the microphone today for us on YouTube. My uncle has abnormally large hands. I still think it is. It's the biggest World Series ring ever made. Florida Marlins. Really? Was it 03 or 02? So he went and they didn't have anything that fit him. And it was a 17 and a half. He has sausage fingers. <laughs> Go on, story time with Cal <laughs> all day long on YouTube. Sir, his uncle's gonna appreciate the TV time that yeah. he got right there about his sausage fingers. It will live forever on YouTube. I need to see these fingers. <laughs> <laughs> we need a photo of the fingers. Post a video. Ooh, Martin Maldonado thinking about a bunt for CY, but pulls back. I like it. When you're hitting, you're trying to get creative up there when you're scuffling a little bit. He, he can peek down now that third base line, and he sees how far back Seeger is. And he says, if I just get it by the pitcher, I think even I can beat this, beat this out. like a punt and bare hand Joe Smith throw did he stay on the bag yes Ty France did for out number two who said pitchers aren't athletes that was a very athletic play right there by Joe Smith able to bounce off the mound right away bare hand this ball he understood the runner that was running get his feet up under him he didn't have to rush it and make a solid throw to first base Barehanded 
called it a snatch. Kind of a, look at this crap. Whoop. If you have Altuve running right there, it forces him to rush a little more. It's a lot tougher play, play to make. When you have the catcher running, you know you have a little extra time to get your feet up under you, plant, and make a strong throw to first. Jose Altuve time. Homered in the fifth. He had gone 134 at bats without a home run. July 30th up until yesterday. Number 26. Today, number 27. Smith is staying right on the corners right there. This is a sizzling bat. Two in his last two. Homerless in his prior 31. Good swings lately from Jose. For Jose to do what we call that in the baseball community is a trophy take. A trophy take is when you pretty much just stand up there, take a ball right down the middle. You had no intention of swinging, but that tells you how uncomfortable it could be to face Joe Smith. Reach for one, and Kelnick makes the call. And the side is retired. Three up, three down. Joe Smith taking over in the sixth inning and doing his job. Mariners need to figure out some offense. 4-2 after six. throw to second and they he missed him a nice move by Mateo he was out the ball beat him but watch this move you talk about athleticism huh well, how does he avoid that tag now you see me now you don't a little magic out there This is this is my chance. I have I have an audience now. If Cody Jinx hears this, I'm going to your concert this offseason. So it's always found me. It's not like he's my walk-up song or anything. Let's go. Cody is definitely going to hear that. And those two are gonna hang out in the offseason. I'm calling it. Thank you, Cal. He's mic'd up today, and we're finishing up this poll question on YouTube, which free agent shortstop is likely on the move this offseason. A lot of Astros fans are watching and voting, clearly, and thinking that Carlos Correa is on his way to another ball club. 35%, and he takes it. Listen, there's a lot of shortstops on there. Who do you think gets the biggest contract out of those guys? Ooh. That's another question. Before the season started, I would have said Kyle's brother, Corey, one and one to the elder Seeger. Corey's dealt with some injuries this year, but man, he was a superstar in the postseason last year. World Series MVP. Did he win NLC NLCS MVP too? He did. Big cut and a miss from Big Bro Kyle. It's one and two. Kyle's been with the same franchise his entire career. Former third round pick out of North Carolina back in 2009. And he's up there in the franchise ranks. 11 seasons with the ball club. And there's a club option for Seager in 2022. 
for 15 million bucks. I'm saying there's no doubt on that club option. No doubt. Getting picked up. I mean, he's he's your guy. He's so durable. He can play the full season. He's not getting injured. He's reliable. And to be reliable has has a cost. He's down on strikes. Here comes Ty France. I thought when you told me the Mariners were going over on the odds courtesy of Bet MGM, it was money. They had two runs in the first, but they need to reach four to beat these odds. And they're going to see another pitcher. Maybe that does the trick. Yimi Garcia, one of the newer members of this bullpen. We'll head to the mound and take over for the Astros in a moment. Shut your eyes and be ready to bail out. If that can't intimidate you, nothing can. You know, I can remember talking to players on other teams where they talk about how players get JRITis. You saw a lot of cases of JRITis. You know, if somebody woke up with a stiff neck and somebody else had a fever or a cough or something like that, they didn't, they didn't want to be out there. Big guys, I mean, Hall of Fame guys, they didn't want to play. They took their days off when JR was pitching. At 6'8 and over 250 pounds, JR was, in fact, an imposing presence on the mound. And there was something else just a bit scary about JR Richard. He is so strong. He's got the, he's got the most uh, ferocious handshake. Uh, that I've ever encountered. He's just got mammoth hands. Uh, as a PR guy at the time, uh, we had him uh, had him pose for a picture, I think, holding eight or nine baseballs in one hand. He has eight. He put nine balls in his hand. Dink, 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 and he went like that. And we took the picture and made a poster out of it. Once we saw that, everybody tried to see how many balls they could hold in their hand, and I think I could hold three or four. I don't think I could hold seven golf balls in my hand. I had two pitches fast and faster. At my best, I could throw it through a car wash and never get it wet. Go behind the scenes, watch exclusive interviews, check out the latest mic up content, and more on the Mariners YouTube channel. Subscribe today at youtube.com slash Mariners. And MLB Originals Season 2 is live on YouTube with new episodes every week. See your favorite players and learn more about the game you love on youtube.com slash MLB. That's where you are right now. MLB YouTube channel for the game of the week. Astros and Mariners for the last time in 2021 in the regular season. First and second place ball clubs in the AL West. Next up out of the bullpen for Dusty Baker, 31-year-old Yimi Garcia. First pitch fouled back by Ty France. We saw Yimi yesterday start the sixth inning, gave up a go-ahead home run to Kyle Seeger. So they say, you know what? We'll let Brooks Raley strike out Seeger. Now you take over for four, five, and six against this Mariners ball club. There's the numbers for Garcia on the year. His four seam fastball velocity has boosted up from last year, which was a career year. And even in 21, he's starting to open up his arsenal quite a bit. He's become pretty much a four or five pitch guy with the four seamer, the slider, the curve, and then he's introduced the changeup and the sinker as well to try to mix it up and be able to keep guys a little more off balance. Ooh, Ty France fouled one off his leg. He's always been an extreme fly ball guy. Seeing high home runs, besides 2020, you know, he's been giving up the long ball, and that's, all, and that's gotten him in trouble. How does that feel? Oh, it never hits the shin guard. Shin guard's right there, and he found a way to hit right above it. <laughs> Back in there. A ball and two strikes. And here we go. You see, you would think they make the shin guard two inches taller. But if you did, he would just hit it off of his knee. <laughs> you just continue to move it up on where you're going to hit the ball. 
you have that pro protection there for good reason because it protects your foot, it protects your ankle, it protects your shin. But you just can't predict where that ball is going to go. More shin coverage, please. He's feeling it too. You see him limping out of the box. If he gets a ground ball right here, we're going to see him limp down the line, I'm assuming. That happened to Jordan Alvarez over the weekend. He came back quickly, though. That was a weird one. He hit it off his back knee. I was watching that game. I know that hurt. I thought he would be out for a little bit. Me too. That is smashed down the line. Ty France is going to head to second easily with a stand-up double. Oh, he's still feeling that. The double always makes it feel a little better, though. <laughs> Run it out. That was absolutely cranked. A great piece, great piece of hitting. Just line the line guy. He gets two strikes on him. He doesn't panic. Stays with his approach. He can go right field line. He can pull it down left field line. We've been harping on him all game, but he deserves it. He's a great hitter. Jimmy just entered. And they're having a chat on the mound. Here's Hanniger, though, pulling one down the line. His first A.B., he went to right field with a single. Oof. But that's the benefit of France hitting the ball all over the yard. You can't shift him. You can't protect the line. You have to play straight up, and it opens up holes for him to be able to get those hits. And he hits fastballs, of course, but what makes him stand out is the secondary stuff he can handle as well. That's Phil Maton, another new member of the Astros bullpen from around the trade deadline in that Miles Straw deal with Cleveland. That was the one portion of the ball club that needed work for Houston. First half of the season, there was bullpen issues. We'll enter Yimi Garcia and Kendall Graveman and Phil Maton. Problem somewhat solved. And Houston, I would say Houston always does a good job in bringing in those complimentary pieces. They're one of the teams that has kept their core together for quite a while. I mean, these guys that are on the field right now are the same guys that I was playing against a few years ago. And that's not common in today's game. Guys move around all the time, but Houston has been able to keep their core together and then bring in a few pieces from time to time when they need them. It could change this offseason a little bit with Correa potentially leaving, mm -hmm. Verlander potentially leaving. But they've been able to deal with that too. I mean, Garrett Cole is now the star in New York City for the Yankees, and yet still this is a top five starting pitching ERA team. When they lost Cole and then, then I saw the news of losing Verlander. Toro, a little squibber. And the play is not in time. Off the bag is Guriel. And safe at first is Toro. France moves up to third. Correa couldn't make the play. Lone man on the left side of the infield. That's Marwin right there. Oh, yeah, Marwin. That's what happens with this shift. Sometimes guys get out of position, and that's a ball that's normally right at Correa. I mean, routine play directly at him, but with that shift, forces Marwin to move to the side. He rushes to get his feet up under him. You see him fall after a throw. The, the ball was pulling that way that he was falling, and it pulls Guriel off the back. It's a hit for Abraham Toro. Runners on the corners with just one down in the seventh. Here's Terenz. I like keeping my shortstop on that side. If he's all alone on the left side and keeping him in familiar territory, I know that most baseballs are heading more towards the middle, and that's why the shift is on. But Marwin could handle a ball up the middle with less ground to cover. Exactly, and that's something that you would see with San Diego a lot to where when they do their shift, Machado will go over to the other side. You keep your shortstop in position because he should have the most range, you're assuming, so you keep him over there by himself and allow him to make those plays. Yeah, that's why Correa has a top five wins above replacement mark, kind of an overall stat to measure how effective he's been. Top five in the AL. 
Okay, so defense didn't work out for Houston here against Toro, but StatCast powered by Google Cloud showing us Jake Myers figuring out where that baseball was going to end up and making a catch that happens just 10% of the time, 106 feet covered by the rookie center fielder to Rob Toro back in the fifth. And there's a big strikeout picked up by Garcia. Terenz goes down and there's two away. Two beautiful sinkers down and in right there on the corner where you feel like you're about to hit and at the last second it drops right under your bat. That's perfect location. Hitting that lower right quadrant. Sinking right under his barrel. And 96 never hurts. For a guy to be able to gain two miles an hour in a year on his fastball, it changes your dynamic as a pitcher. The strategy here is like a playoff game. I mean, this is a huge matchup against the team looking up at Houston in the standings. So now it's Phil Maton time in the seventh with two outs and two on for Seattle. And with the team just one game back, the September battle cry that had come straight out of the stands was feeling more real than ever. Somebody had a banner. It was out in center field that said, refuse to lose. And Luke said, I saw, I saw that sign and said, refuse to lose. I like that. And I mean, that was it. The sellout crowd gives the Mariners a standing ovation. I remember that even if we were losing, we felt that we can come back in any game. Every day there was a new hero. Alex belts the ball deep to left field. Oh, that will fly away. And the magic is in Seattle. Right away. And the Mariners win it. 46,000 fans are losing their minds. People were starting to really recognize something really special is happening here. That time, there's no louder stadium. Every day was louder and louder and louder. The Kingdom became one of the characters in the story. It was like being on the inside of a popcorn popper every single night. Let's go back in time. Edgar Martinez, the Hall of Famer, off Jack McDowell, ALDS, 95, game five. That was a talented Seattle team. Griffey, come on down. He was gliding around those bases right yeah. there. That's one of the most memorable plays ever right there. Yeah, super stall ball club, but they've never been to the World Series. It's the longest active pennant drought at 45 seasons. The only active MLB franchise to never make it to the Fall Classic. See, the other streaks are for teams that have been to the World Series. So they have that and the postseasonless drought, which goes back to 2001, but they're working on that. Phil Maton, numbers with Cleveland and then Houston this year. ERA in the four and a half range going up against Jared Kelnick. The rookie goes after the first pitch and puts it in the air. Myers tracking back, similar spot where he made a catch. This time he's going to have to play it off the wall. And the Mariners are going to tie up this game. Jared Kelnick has himself a two RBI double. One pitch from Phil Maton turns into a 4-4 contest. It's a great piece of hitting for Kelnick to be ready for that first pitch breaking ball right there. I'm assuming there was something in the scout report. A lot of times right before you're at bat, you go to your hitting coach, you look at the scout report, you know what he throws in different situations. And right here, to him, for him to be able to take that breaking ball the other way, it tells me that he was ready for it. He was wait, wait, willing to sit back and wait on it and drive it the other way. It's a great piece of hitting. France is in. Toro standing. We are tied. I think now is the time to mention that the Seattle Mariners are 29 and 17 in one run games. Most one run wins in baseball this year. Houston in those games are 16 and 16. And the two words that have been echoed nationally about the Mariners that I don't care a ton about 
run differential. At this point in the year, yes, run differential matters. It tells you a little bit about your team. But going into the last month of the season, as the team, you're not worried about it. You can't worry about that anymore. It doesn't matter how we got here. All that matters is that we're here in these games that we have coming up. It doesn't matter that we're minus 45 run differential. Like, understand that's, that's a big deal, and it means a lot to how they got to this situation, and it speaks a lot to their bullpen. But when you're playing the game, you're not worried about any of that right now. You just have to be in this position. A lot of late offense and a shutdown bullpen for Seattle. Part of that one run record. This is the career pinch hitting line for Jake Bowers, seven for 33. This season, in his last 17 games, he's 10 for 30. So in 2007, there was an Arizona Diamondbacks team that won the AL West with a negative 20, or the NL West, I should say, with a negative 20 run differential. The Mariners in the AL West this year are at minus 56. I know a little bit about, about, about that team. Yeah? I think I played on that team. I think you did. <laughs> and with that team in 2007, I distinctly remember we depended on our bullpen so much. We had really good starting pitching with Brandon Webb, but we needed our bullpen, back end of the bullpen guy. Valverde was our closer. We knew we could play seven inning games. Brandon Lyon was out there. If we could lead after seven or be close after seven, we felt good that we could win the game. And the Mariners are in that position now. You led that 07 team with 32 home runs. Jared Kelnick with the big swing on the first pitch that he saw from Phil Maton ties up the game. Fresh contest. Let's stretch. Join the team. Be a part of the Astros Buddies Club. Kids 12 and under can sign up to be a member of the club, where members get access to exclusive activities, a backpack, socks, and an Astros hat, all for only $25. Show your Astros pride at home, school, and at the ballpark. Get your membership today by visiting astros.com forward slash buddies. Looking for fun with the fam this summer? Look no further than Minute Maid Park. Carlos Correa! A walk up grand slam! This ball ripped down the right side. He's gonna be waved around! Astros win it! Get your tickets now at astros.com slash tickets. The postseason race is on MLB.tv, now only $26.99. Catch all the action live or on demand, plus MLB Big Innings. Restrictions apply. Visit MLB.tv for details. Coming off the seventh inning stretch, for, we gave out some peanuts and Cracker Jacks. It was fun. Tradition here in the Astros booth. Anyway, worst run differential among teams with a 500 record. Seattle's not 500. They're nine games over at minus 56. Meanwhile, the Astros are plus 176, third best in Major League Baseball. Well, guess what? Seattle is in a fight for a playoff spot. They're not there, but they're three games out. And to me, that also gives extra credit to their skipper, Scott Service, in a manager of the year race in the American League. Managing tight ball games and turning up with victories, that certainly helped. And he calls it, forget run differential, fun differential. That's a, that's a great point by him. In those close games for a manager, you have to make a lot of calls, a lot of clutch calls. And without those one-run games, the, the Mariners are in a completely different position. You're not even talking about the Mariners right now. We're probably not even doing their game. But being able to win those close games gives the team an extra boost of confidence to where you never you feel like you're never out of the game and you're ready to play and you're and you're being very competitive and it's great for them. 
Anthony Misevich in the game. And firing a strike. Brantley, Guriel, Alvarez do up for Houston in the home seventh. Brantley's hit list today. So we say we said earlier, the keys to the game, you have to stay within striking distance. They're definitely there. And now it's up to that bullpen. Misevich has it bounce off, I think, his pitching hand and turn into an infield knock for Michael Brantley. We'll see if he's okay. That's a hit, and how's that left hand? See where it got him. Let's see where it got him. He's rubbing the ball down. I think he's standing in the game. His body language looked like he was hurting. Yeah. Quite a bit right there. He was in between trying to use his glove and use his hand. And sometimes you'll see pitchers just try to get out of the way and let their defense behind them make that play. But he got his feet kind of tied up to where. He felt something on maybe his ankle or his legs to where he was limping right there. Just an awkward play. Very awkward. Looks like he's doing all right, though. Always go glove. Johan Ramirez is there just in case. And he just told him, you can chill a little bit. <laughs> like Diego Castillo in the Mariners bullpen is also just starting to stretch the arm out and get ready. A great point by Cowboy Jeff. The Astros always seem to be in close games in these games of the week. Yeah, Jeff, and we thank them for that. It's been fun. Guriel on the ground, and this could be two. There's one. Crawford fires to first in time. And suddenly the left hand feels even better. Absolutely. Anthony's been used a lot this season. He leads the Mariners on appearances this season. So he's a dependable guy. He knows when the game starts. He's going to find his way into that lineup. Find his way to the mound. And that erases Brantley and takes care of Guriel. Sweet turn there by J.P. Crawford. Off the feed from Toro. And here comes Jordan Alvarez after one more look from Julie Guriel. Sevic still limping a bit. Sevic, 26 years old, facing Jordan Alvarez. Lefty on lefty, although I will say Alvarez has no problem with Southpaws in his young career. He has no problem with him. He's able to stay square. And he lifts one right center. It's hanging up there for Hanniger to put him away. Nice work. Lead off hit for Brantley, but Guriel bounces into a double play. Alvarez flies out, and Misevich heads back to the dugout after 7-4-4. My name is Tyson Martin. I'm from Seattle, Washington and I'm 13 years old. I was born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, so half a heart. I've had 22 procedures and four open heart surgeries. I like baseball, shoes. I have two sisters, one older, one younger, and one younger brother. I like to customize shoes, collect sneakers, and I'm trying to start up a business where I customize shoes. It's easy being his dad. He's blown me out of the water on numerous occasions just by um, what he's done and what he's chosen to do. I, I love watching him play because I, I understand what it, what it takes for him to, to be on the field. Overcoming hypoplastic left heart syndrome makes limited me to stuff that I can do and I still try to do it, but, and I'm playing baseball, so that's pretty good. I'm Tyson, and I'm a member of the first class of the Hometown Nine. A 
Another great one. The MLB Game of the Week live on YouTube is presented by YouTube Shorts. Watch and create videos on YouTube. Try Shorts in the YouTube app on your phone. Check out the Astros YouTube page for insider content, including behind-the-scenes takes from your favorite Astros players, coaches, broadcasters, and more. Visit YouTube.com slash Astros to subscribe to the channel today. Scott Braun, Chris Young, Brett Dolan. Ball game still fresh, 4-4. Four, four. We're in the eighth. Kendall Graveman against his former ball club, the 30-year-old having a career season ERA at 169 on the year. I remember when he was a starting pitcher, especially in, say, 2015, soft tosser. He's pitching low 90s, 91-ish. Now the sinker averages about 96 miles an hour. He is transformed into a serious weapon out of the bullpen for Houston. What a transformation. What a transformation that is. I mean, he's a guy when he's on the mound now, you're going up there knowing that he's going to give you a sinker. But he has the, he has the big depth on it to where even if, if you're looking at it, it's a struggle to get to. Traded at the deadline from Seattle to Houston. Astros needed bullpen help. This was their big target. Here he is pitching in the eighth. Scoreless eighth last night and 13 pitches to get the job done. Marmalejos in the nine spot. Doubled in the fourth. Takes a strike to start off the eighth. Right there, the first pitch slider, you're just keeping everybody honest. Make sure he's not trying to jump ship or sneak attack you right out the gate. Show the, show the slider first, and then go to your bread and butter, which is that sinker. You have fun with that. did like about seeing the personal side of players when he did get traded from Seattle I mean he was clearly very emotional about it you know you, you realize the type of bond that these guys have with each other Armalejos not pleased with the call strike three frozen it's a borderline pitch right there What's your call? It's been a great strike zone all day. I mean, that's a borderline pitch. I'm mad at him. I'm mad at the call if I'm hitting. But once I go in to the you know video room or whatever it may be after the game to look at that pitch, what I'm going to say is that you haven't called that all day. <laughs> that's what I'm going to say. That sounds so good. I'm not happy about that's it. That's through the vacated left side. It's a one out knock for J.P. Crawford. Yeah, it was a money pitch there for Kendall Graveman to pick up the first out, but now dealing with a speedy runner on first in Crawford. J.P. Crawford being able to beat the ship right there, he keeps finding a way to get on base, make things happen, especially against the Astros. And in clutch moments. We're up to Hanniger. His base hit was off the third base bag in the first. He ended up scoring. It's a two run first inning for Seattle. First five batters went four for five in the game. Then they cooled off for a while and picked things back up in the seventh with two more to tie things up thanks to a Jared Kelnick double. Great pitch right there, painting down the zone. Hanniger known to make the adjustment this season to be a lot more aggressive in the box. So he was up there ready to make a move, but that fast, that sinker is just so sneaky, he couldn't pull the trigger on it. Manninger does pull the trigger this time, and it's in the shallow. Wright's gonna fall. On to second is the throw in time. Oh, Kyle Tucker deked us a bit on a little blooper that ends up being a force out at second. And that's a play where nobody did anything wrong. Crawford did exactly what he was supposed to do on the bases. When you're right there in between first and second and you watch that ball in the air, there is no real way for you to tell if Tucker's going to be able to lay out and make that play or if he's going to let it drop. And Tucker did the right thing 
by not giving up on the ball, showing that he was coming after it. But when the ball drops, having the wherewithal to keep his bearings and make a strong throw to second base. And a great snag by Altuve right there. Altuve had to turn into a little first baseman right there. Wow. Two down in the eighth. Great call right there. Great Money. play by Altuve getting stretched out. Yeah, scooping nice that pick. ball out. Money throw. Most, so it's a fielder's choice most, for Mitch Haniger. <laughs> exactly. That's what I was going to say. That's the most unfortunate part about that <laughs> is that you get a fielder's choice on a ball that could be a single if nobody was on base. Yeah, no hit for Haniger, making him now one for five on the day. Kyle Seeger's turn. Kyle Tucker is a special ball player. Tools galore. He, he's got power in the bat. He can run. Clearly can field his position. Young ball player. And he still somewhat does it under the radar. Yeah. Like when you think of the Astros, you don't. Kyle Tucker is not the first person that you think of, but when you come to the game and see his skill set, see what he's able to do on both sides of the ball, you realize how valuable he is to this team. That one looked like it missed the mark on the changeup from Graveman and strike one. All right, the zone is opening up a little oh, bit yeah. late in the game. That's <laughs> not there. Seeger waited for a tick. <laughs> Seager froze on that one, like, here we go. Graveman's like, where was that? Well, where was the pitch before? <laughs> Not that that matters, but Kyle Seager, take your base. That was low. That's low. That's a ball. I mean, Maldonado is an excellent framer behind the plate. <laughs> Look where his glove ends up, right <laughs> in the middle <laughs> of the zone. It's a veteran move right there. Yeah. Ty France climbs in. A single, a double, and two strikeouts. Craven being very effective to right-handed hitters throughout the season, giving up zero extra base hits to them. I don't know if that if that bothers Ty France at all because he's not up there trying to hit an extra base hit. He's up there trying to keep the line moving. He'll take a slap the other way and be very happy with it. And where is that baseball? Maldonado can't oh, find it. Here. And both runners will move up. Graveman had to help him out for a second. So right here, you have France in a 2-0 count, who's been hot all year. You have Toro on deck, who has killed you since the trade happened. This is a situation where it's, it's a tough call to make for Dusty Baker, for Graveman, for Maldonado. You got the righty on righty matchup that you would normally would want right here. Wild pitch from Graveman. Yeah, pick your poison. I mean, France has the hit tool. And he pulls one, third base side. And this will do it. All right. Wasn't the smoothest day for Kendall Graveman, but no runs come across for Seattle. They strand two in scoring position. And this game remains tied at four. When you show up to empty stands, last year was not the same. Part of my rehab and my motivation to really get back to this team was being able to hear those fans and be able to experience Minute Maid pack to the roof one more time. The noise, the atmosphere, it's unmatched. Come every day and they support us. They're out there screaming and it just makes us want to play better as a team. I think we have the best fans in baseball. The main reason why we play because of them. This is one of the most community-minded teams that I've ever been on. Yeah. And, and these guys are very aware that they are part of the community. Uh, I, you know, I had a long conversation with a lot of the guys that donated water. Um, and I had a real long conversation with, you know, with Bregman that always steps up. 
Yeah. You know, you got Altuve and you got Correa and all these guys always step up for the community. You know, I thought that was pretty, uh, you know, pretty cool. Let's do it. Locked up at four apiece. We're in the home eighth, and we're looking at the teams to reach the LCS in four straight postseasons. The Houston Astros have done it and taken a couple pennants and one championship. Saw the Cardinals and Braves in the 90s, the Yankees had that dominant run, and the Yanks are actually the last team to win back-to-back -back World Series. It was three in a row back in that time period, and then you look at that Oakland team in the 70s. So it doesn't happen often to get that consistent success that we've seen from this Houston franchise. And also, I just think about how difficult it is to win back-to-back -back World Series titles. We haven't seen it in over 20 years at this point. And I think the team that won last year certainly still has a good shot. Los Angeles Dodgers fighting for an NL West. And we'll get to them in a moment. Diego Castillo is about to make his 50th appearance of the season. He started the year on Tampa Bay. He was one of their better relievers, closing out games, and you know the race. They're like, no, we don't have emotions with our moves. Not at all. I mean, right here, you have a true slider monster. I mean, this guy, Diego Castillo, he's a majority slider guy. I mean, you're going to see a slider almost 7% of the time, and then he uses the sinker off of that. So to be able to have that much confidence in your slider to where guys know that they're going to get it and they still can't hit it, that tells you the depth that he has on it. And I'm assuming we're going to see quite a bit of it this inning. There it is to Carlos Correa. That was a short slider, too. It almost had a cutter action to it, just enough to get you off the barrel. But he can throw strikes with it as well. So different versions of the slider. Making it like multiple pitches. That one is connected. It's a fastball. Correa likes it. And he's on with a leadoff hit in the eighth. This is what the Astros do. They're going to keep pressure on you. Correa's been having great at-bats as of late. Consistently putting great at-bats together. Coming through late in the game. You get Correa in the seventh, eighth, ninth inning. It's almost a guarantee that he's going to come through right now. Picks a good spot. Looks over to the dugout, too, to pump them up. And Castillo disappointed. What he's disappointed in right there is the shift. Yeah. <laughs> what he saw was Someone's a ground ball to second to base. He feels like somebody's supposed to be right there. And it messes with some pitchers. I played with some guys who would rather not have the shift at all and just take their medicine if they gave up a <laughs> legit hit in their eyes. But they couldn't stand that one time that you hit the ball right at where somebody should be and it gives up a base hit, especially late in the game. When someone in the front office or coaching staff has to put together a highlight reel of all the times that it helps and say, look, watch this. Kyle Tucker has been on base in five of his last six at-bats. He is smoking hot right now. Time to Correa for just a second. Three of his hits over 100. Then that one right there was 99 point and some change. Right, the first three times oh. up, you're saying, was Oh, 99 100. earlier in the game. Oh, 99. I mean, let's, let's give him four balls at 100 miles an hour. Two of them were outs. Two of them were singles. Two strikes on Kyle Tucker since coming off the COVID IL. 13 games up until today, and then the numbers look even more video game-ish because he's two for two, double, triple, walk. And in the last two weeks, this is the guy you want up if you're Houston. A lot Ooh. of situations, when you come off the IL, and you put up numbers like that, it's almost like a huge trade acquisition <laughs> late in the season. 
Big time. Him and Bregman coming back around the same time, but look at him gone fishing. I mean, yeah, that slider right there is just nasty. I mean, he, he sees that ball out of his hand as that same sinker, and he attacks it like it is a sinker. But then it got a guess. He's picking and choosing. And he guessed sinker, and he was wrong. Jake Myers is hitless in three trips today. Look at that line for the rookie. About a month of baseball. Over 300 with the batting average for the center fielder. What I like about Castillo, he's staying down in the zone. He's trying to stay away from damage pitches. When you leave something up in the zone in a yard like this with that short left field porch, it doesn't take much to get it out of there. So he's staying down, down, and down. Try to get his ground ball, try to get a double play. Down for a swing and a miss. That's one of those pitches on TV. It's like, oh, why'd you just stay back on it and hit the other way? That pitch right there is painted on the corner, down and away. There's no chance in a 1-0 count that you're able to drive that ball. That's a pitch you have two strikes on you and you choke down and pepper it the other way. Castillo is just recently back from the injured list. Right shoulder inflammation. He did appear yesterday in the eighth inning, scoreless inning. Took him 20 pitches. And his below's down a little bit. He's averaging 94. Last year was averaging 96. He's a strike. And he gets that strike call because he's so close to the zone on every single pitch to where the umpire is Low-key guessing in these situations, yeah, that was close enough. They're all close. They all look like strikes. They all look just off the plate. I'm trying to, and it's so hard to, to gauge that with the naked eye. It was in the zone 90% of the way and then tailed off at the end. Well, Myers with an underwater swing, and he goes down. And that was an impressive sequence right there. Working that slider down and away, sinker down and in, all around the plate the entire time. And able to expand late with two strikes. That was beautiful. I honestly think anybody would have struck out with that sequence right there. Yeah, that was a special sequence put together by Diego Castillo. Fooling the rookie Myers, now dealing with the veteran Marwin Gonzalez, who homered in the second. Similar swing there that we saw from Myers. <laughs> if you're looking at these swings, these guys are so uncomfortable and they're not able to pick up that spin. So they see it popping out of his hand and they're literally guessing, is this the sinker or the slider? Alex Bregman's going, I wouldn't have swung at that. <laughs> we'll Did see. Did you see me yesterday against Paul Seawald? Yeah, we'll see. If Marwin can keep this inning going. He's had some really clutch hits in Astros franchise history. He's received by far the best ovation with us being here inside the ballpark multiple times, hearing the crowd go nuts for Marwin Gonzalez. I mean, he took that one, but it's in the zone. Yeah, when you take it, it rides out through the zone. When you swing at it, it drops. There was a time where you had Castillo when he was in Tampa, Castillo and Alvarado in the same bullpen. Talk about a righty-lefty combo right there for you. Yeah, movement off the charts from both of them. And it's pulled foul by Gonzalez. Back in the second inning. Kyle Tucker on, Marwin Gonzalez to the Crawford boxes and beyond. 400 feet. His first home run back with the Astros. And his third on the season. This place has to feel like home for him. Yeah. He's in an 0-2 hole. 
Diego. Tempting. So and Diego Castillo is feeling himself right now. Oh, he's feeling himself. And these next these next couple pitches, he's going to continue to try to expand the zone. I don't see him giving Marwin anything to hit these next couple pitches. He's going to either go slider down and in on him, or he can, he can sneak that sinker away on him as well. But I haven't seen a pitch middle up this entire inning. I mean, he's staying out of trouble. He's staying down in the zone. We're about to see this sinker right here. He's going to sinker away. Nice job to stay alive. Just waiting for a mistake that has not happened yet. That was a great piece of hitting by Marwin. I know it's a foul ball, but that, that wins him another pitch. This ball takes off, off the plate. Marwin's able to cover that, but that tells me that he may have a little somewhere that he can expose him on the inside right here. If you can cover that, we're gonna go, now we're gonna go in and see if you can cover both sides. Oh, wow, what an inning from Diego Castillo. <laughs> you can't cover both. Produces the whiff after the Correa single. Tucker Myers Gonzalez. Foolish. And Diego Castillo brought his A-plus stuff into the eighth inning. And it's the Mariners' turn in the ninth. Coming up. Oh, don't come near me, Mitch. Hey, dude, I'm mic'd up right now. <laughs> what? You better give me some of these clips. <laughs> I know, that's what I'm trying to do. Kyle, you want to play catch today? Nope. I want him to hit line drives. You have to make a read. You have to play it back. Go get it. This is more realistic, you know? This is what I like. What kind of shoes are you working with, JP? James Hardon. Oh, new Adidas? Hey, what are those called? These? Yeah. I don't know, I found them on eBay, dude. 80 bucks used steel. <laughs> you get that one? And we go to the ninth inning tied at four. The Mariners, though, have not hit a home run today. You may lose this bet as far as percentage of runs scored on home runs. The Giants lead everybody at 51%. Mariners were second last week. They're now third. 49% of the runs come with the long ball. And Scott and CY in games they don't home are 13 and 26. So we'll see if they can change that or whether they're headed towards extra innings again. Another area that they normally have great success with. Yeah, great point. Thanks, Brett. I mean, Yesterday we saw extras and Seattle not coming out on top. But the Mariners in close late situations have been clutch all year. They're hoping it rides them into a postseason. And good luck with Ryan Presley. The all star with the ERA south of two. Ninth inning action Toro. Terenz Kelnick. There's a strike to Abraham Toro, who actually is two for three with a home run and a double off the Astros reliever. That homer came in Toro's Mariners debut on July 27th. It's also two for four today. He's swinging the bat well. Impressive with a lot of success. A little fastball slider curve mix. Look what happened to Ryan Presley last night. Brantley fouls the ball off of Presley in the dugout. Look at him, he got drilled in the dugout. Limping a bit, 
He didn't look like he was too happy about that. No. He pitched in the game yesterday in the ninth, trailing 3 2. Oh, wow. Barry's one in the dirt. Toro goes after it and strikeout number one for Presley here in the ninth. But yesterday, Toro got him for a double, and then Terenz brought Toro home with the RBI single. This time he says, go for that. There's two secondary pitches that are standout. You got two strikes on him. You go ahead and take a gamble, expand the zone, go ahead and spike one. He wants to make sure not to hang this pitch right here. So you go ahead and bury it in the dirt, see if you can get the fish to bite. It's Terenz who got to him for the RBI hit yesterday. Today he's 0 for 3 with a walk. A long swing. A slider right there on the corner. That's the dominant pitch for Ryan Presley. Batters just 132 off the slider with one extra base hit this year. And he connects right center field. Luis Terenz with a hit in back-to-back -back days off Ryan Presley. This game is tied at four because Jared Kelnick contributed a double that went a long way. StatCast powered by Google Cloud. 387 feet. It's a homer in two ballparks. This one is off the tall wall in left center and scores two. The rookie coming through and the Mariners in yet another close game. And looking to come through in another clutch situation, potentially try to get that player of the game. If you can come through here and get that go-ahead RBI. Last man off the bench, Dylan Moore, is in the game as a pinch runner. Terenz is out. Moore now in the DH spot. He's on first. The only disadvantage I would say to the shift right here, you see Correa pulled over to the right side of second base. The only disadvantage of the shift here, it's very tough a lot of times to get that double play ball that you need to get out of the inning. So the trade-off is you cover more ground on the right side, but the disadvantage is you may not be able to get that double play. You may have to get two guys to get out right here. Impressive trying here. to get rid of the runner. <laughs> trying to keep him close for sure. He's only allowed two stolen bases in the last couple seasons. Dusty's group going for a sweep today. What a game. Kelnick takes it down. More at first base, 18 for 22 in stolen bases. So Presley has good reason to be concerned about him over there at first. You got to keep him close. Try to keep the double play in order as much as you can and hope that they have to earn two hits to get this runner to score. With the quick slide step right there, it's going to be tough for him to get this bag up. And with Maldonado behind the dish. Maldonado's Sometimes he would have. Sometimes what will happen here when you're focusing so much on that run on first base is that you don't focus on the hitter as much as you need to. You get behind the count and you leave a ball over the middle of the plate. But Kelnick, who's feeling good today? Yeah, single, double. Oh, back pick try. And Moore is safe. Maldonado. He's sneaky. Well, Yadi Molina impersonation yeah. right there. Okay. Be able to scoop that ball, make a perfect throw to first base. Some catchers will go down to a knee right there and just block that ball to make sure it doesn't get by him. Are you swinging here? 3-0 if it's a good one? No. Same story for Kelney. Two on, one out in the ninth. We talked about it earlier, Scott. We got to keep the line moving. 
Don't have to be the hero right here. Don't try to do too much, which a lot of times with a young team, you'll see guys try to do too much. But Kelnick with a great at bat, having a great day, able to stay within himself. Just try to keep the line moving. Take your walk. It's the catcher spot. Cal Raleigh do up. There he is. Only 12 this walks issued by Ryan Presley this season. The latest to Jared Kelnick. Now Raleigh, who was crushing the baseball at Triple A Tacoma this year, 324 from the catcher with a 608 slugging percentage. It's that's been quieter here in the bigs. He said he's not handling some pitches that he destroyed in the minors. This would be a good time to figure it all out. A great time to put it all together. This is a game that the Mariners really need. When you have a you had to blow out on the first game last night, you had a very, very close game that the Mariners would like to be able to walk away with. And now you find yourself in the same situation again on the day game on your getaway day. The only way to create a happy flight right here today is to get this win. If you come to Houston and you get swept, it, it does put a damper on, on your feelings for this playoff push. Granted, you could pick yourself up, up even if you don't win this game, but I think this is a big game. I, I thought last night felt like a big game as well. I agree, and we can say that in mid-September. You know, in May, okay, right. hold up. But it's mid-September. There are quite a few teams in the mix for that AL wild card sp spot, two of them. Seattle's one of those teams, three games back. Ooh, pitch gets away. Oh, we got to go. We got to play. both runners are moving up and in there safely. Maldonado went after the lead runner more, but he got to third. That's terrifying as the base runner. You see the pass ball, you make the right call, you see it ricochet off of the wall. And you know there's about to be a play right here. I gotta go. It looks like there was a mix up on pitch selection right there, which is why they're gonna have a meeting. Maldonado's thinking slider. Presley's thinking heater. Very costly because now a deep enough fly ball can put the Mariners back in front. Call the wild pitch. So with one out here with the base open, the benefit for Presley is that you're still in the bottom of the lineup. You would ideally like to get the eight hole and nine hole hitter out right here as opposed to having to, you know, allow him to get the first base and give Crawford another opportunity to come through in a big situation like he did yesterday. Now you have a few chances to bury that signature breaking ball and escape here. Absolutely. This is where you trust your catcher. You're going to expand the zone. You're going to bounce something. Hope you get Raleigh, Raleigh to, to chase. And you'll trust that Maldonado will prevent the ball from getting to the backstop. One, two. Ooh. That's trust right there. Maldonado with work to do this afternoon. Perfect form, keeping the ball in the middle of his body, taking it off the, tre the chest protector, knowing that he's saving a run and, 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 and accepting that pressure. He's telling his pitcher, trust me, I got you. Does he try it again at 2-2? Got him! No swing from Raleigh. Frozen for strike three in the second punch out of the day for Ryan Presley. And right here out of his hand, he's seeing that slider spin. And he's assuming that ball is going to drop the same way the previous pitch did. But this almost had a backup slider effect to it to where it stayed up and rolled through the zone. And he knew it right away that it was a strike. Borderline pitch. 
But to the naked eye, it looked like a strike. Ryan Presley is not a fun AB. Now it's Jose Marmalejos. Man. Martin Maldonado stealing the show. Behind the plate, making another big stop. Strikeouts, bookending a single and a walk for the Mariners here in the ninth. A wild pitch, moving both runners up. And the Mariners, known for being so good with runners in scoring position, have stranded 12 runners today. Armalejos up the middle, he comes through. The Mariners grab the lead back with one, and here comes another. Dylan Moore and Jared Kelnick score. It's 6 4 Seattle. Huge hit from Marmaleos right there to come through a clutch situation. Did he take advantage of the shift again? Shift has come into play a lot today. That is a ground ball right at the shortstop. Covers that pitch off the plate, stays through it right at the shortstop. You would be out of the inning. I mean, you're, you're Presley sitting there. I guess the shift, give it and take it away too, just as yes. <laughs> like the left field wall. It's a ground ball. That's a ground ball. And a pitching change. That'll do it for Ryan Presley. Blake Taylor will take over for Dusty Baker's Houston Astros. Now down by two. Stay tuned because the Astros were down by two yesterday, and we know how that one finished up. I'd probably be embarrassed if I actually knew how much money I spend on Chipotle a month. Can you give me a hint? Can I call a friend? Marco. Polo. Dang it. I'm going to go out on a limb. That's Justice Sheffield. I don't know. I mean, I feel like he would just be irresponsible with Chipotle money. That is Justice? All right, sweet. I knew it. Who, th who thinks Chipotle needs to have a burrito wrapping seminar? To have a burrito wrapping seminar. For those workers who have no clue, no clue how to wrap one. All right, so this is somebody who's never worked a day in their life, probably. Someone's sassy. Is that Chef too? Is, that, is he going on that Chipotle rant? No. I'm gonna go with like Mitch Haniger on that. Haniger? Sassy. You described an outfitter as sassy, huh? Uh oh. I don't know, cause he's, he's he would he would be sassy about people being terrible burrito wrappers. Is it? Is it? Yeah. No. I mean, is this from 2013? You guys are going through my head? Ten years ago. <laughs> Hanny, that's so mean. Why would you say that? Have a little compassion. It's the MLB Game of the Week live on YouTube, presented by YouTube Shorts. Watch and create videos on YouTube. Try Shorts in the YouTube app on your phone. Another dramatic game on YouTube this week. The Mariners grab the lead back in the ninth from all-star closer Ryan Presley, who picks up just his third blown save of the season in 26 chances, and he's now out of the game as Dusty Baker summons Blake Taylor. The 26-year-old left-hander here in the ninth trying to pick up one more out and then get it to his all-world offense. Blake Taylor, another fastball slider guy with extreme splits against left-handed and right-handed hitters. Left-handed batters batting 123 off of them. Right-handers over 305. 305 on base for, um, batting average. Well, here's your lefty swinger, J.P. Crawford. Did not go. That's Bill Miller over there at third base. Jose Marmalejos 
pictured there with a few steps off first. The big man of the hour. Let's have two strikes on Crawford. Marmalejos with a bouncing ball through the middle. Six hole, scores two. Dylan Moore and Jared Kelnick make it a 6-4 contest here in the ninth. Here's your number nine hitter with the clutch knock. He had a big season at AAA too. Big, big. And coming through clutch in a big situation. It doesn't matter on if somebody should have been playing the defense there. He hit it where they weren't. And that was huge for Seattle right here. So for Seawall coming in, I'm assuming he's coming in to close this game. He's going to have his hands full. You have Maldonado who's supposed to lead off. You would assume that we're going to see Bregman in this situation. Oh, yeah. I mean, he had his feet up in the first inning, but I guarantee <laughs> you he's in the cage right now getting ready for this big at bat and to get to Altuve and Brantley. We'll show you how all of the drama unfolded yesterday. I mean, I think Bregman sleeps with that bat, so he is a baseball junkie. And show up to this ballpark and take swings in the cage at midnight just for fun if he can't sleep. And if Seawall comes in, I'm curious to see how he pitches him today. Crawford drives one to deep right field. Tucker looking back and forget about it. It's gone. J.P. Crawford for two to make it 8-4 Seattle. Huge hit, hanging slider. He says he doesn't care about the splits. JP's listening to the broadcast. I don't care about the lefty on lefty split. See why? If he hangs it, I'll bang it. Muscle up, Mr. Leadoff man. Big extra two for Seattle. Seventh home run of the season, just the fourth home run in his career off a left-handed pitcher. And that is just a hanging slider, spinning right over the middle of the, middle of the field. And as soon as he hit, he's looking at his dugout. Now Hanniger, hot shot, handled nicely by Gonzalez. And wow, what a pick by Gurriel over at first. But J.P. Crawford adds on two more for the M's after the Marmalejos two-run single. A four spot for Seattle saying, don't sweep us, please. We need this game. Paul Seawalt against the team that came back and won it in extras last night. Next. Gorgeous evening for baseball here at Minute Maid Park. The Astros opening day. And it's 6-1 to one, St. Louis. Astros have lost seven in a row. Lowest scoring team in Major League Baseball. 15 and 30 is an ugly start, and that's a big hill to overcome. Berkeley hits a high drive, home run. Astros win again. The Astros clinch the wild card. This game ties 6-6 in the bottom of the 18th inning. Lining it to left. It's gone. Holy Toledo. What a way to finish. This ballpark is just ready to erupt. They're down a run. One went away. The pitch in the air, deep to left. Scott! The Astros lead four to two. In the air, left field, and Pools has given St. Louis the lead. You know what? Every single guy in our ball club says, this is the way it's supposed to be. That game is gone. Let's get on to the next game. They're down to an out. Fly ball into right field. The Houston Astros are going to the World Series for the first time in franchise history. It is 8-4 Seattle. They put up four against Ryan Presley and Blake Taylor in the ninth inning to build up an advantage heading into the last of the ninth. And FYI, they did review this play to end the ninth, the top portion of it, and Yuli Gurriel did, in fact, keep that foot on the bat. So inning over. 
It's all good. It's all great right now for Scott Service and the Seattle Mariners until they look up and realize that Dusty Baker gets to place Alex Bregman in this game as his pinch hitter. Bregman with the two-run home run to save the day for Houston in the ninth yesterday against the man on the mound now. Paul Seawald trying to shut the door for Seattle with a four-run edge. He's been awesome this year. Here's another pitcher that completely transformed himself from his days with the New York Mets. Spent a lot of time with that organization, moves over to Seattle, and he is a really difficult look. Low arm angle, 31 years old, and he too is having a career year out of the Seattle bullpen. Over 15 strikeouts per nine innings. He's a guy who just drops and drives that fastball. I mean, he's a fastball slider guy. The homer he gave off of gave up to Bregman yesterday was very rare for him. First homer he's allowed in the first homer he's allowed in the four seamer all year long. It was a 93 mile an hour fastball yesterday from Seawald that was put over the wall. And the first home run for Bregman since June 9th. And that's very common for a pitcher. If I give up a home run to you on a certain pitch, the next at bat I'm gonna come right at you with that same pitch to show you that I'm not scared to throw it to you. And he came with two fastballs challenging Bregman right out the gate. And Bregman is probably thinking about the slider because he's thinking, I, I took you deep yesterday on the fastball. Such a mental game we play on both sides. I like just watching. <laughs> okay, Bregman stays alive. Last night, Astros down two. Not anymore. Bregman with the big homer, big two-run homer yesterday. And the reason he got to that fastball is because Seawall couldn't find his slider to Bregman early in the count to where he had to come with the fastball. But Bregman seems like he sees him pretty well, though. He's had some good, good at-bats off of Seawall. Yeah, I mean, they matched up twice in the past week. Bregman's two for two against him. He's in 357 since coming back from the IL. Missed a couple months. And you have that gauntlet waiting after Bregman goes the other way. And that is going to drop in the corner as a foul ball. Some hitters just have their guys that they're able to see better than others. I mean, Seawall makes so many players look uncomfortable. And then you get Bregman in the box, and it seems like he's able to see everything that he's throwing. Seawall trying to reestablish himself after this, after the last game. He really got in trouble with the big walk to Altuve, which set up the homer to Bregman. So in today's game, he says, I'm going to go ahead and attack the strike zone and go up right after Bregman and make these guys you know, hit the ball. I mean, four-run cushion changes the game and changes your mindset as well, though. Bregman's mostly been pulling the baseball lately, and he does just that to the Crawford boxes. He's got another. You have your guys. This is becoming a thing right here. Alex Bregman, go long. 8-5, no outs in the ninth. Back-to-back -back nights, Bregman off of Seawalt. That Crawford home run may end up being bigger than initially seen. This game is far from over with this Astros offense. Now Jose Altuve in the top of the order for the Astros. Seawald starts him with a strike. Ooh. Was that second row? First? Let's see. First row, knocked the hat off. The front row into the Crawford boxes. Bregman had the day off up until that point. Pinch hit, homer. Now Altuve who homered in the fifth. 
Bregman against Seawald is turning into Chris Young against Chris Carpenter. You know what I'm saying? Chris Carpenter was my guy. 11 for 18, two home runs for CY. And there's no way to describe it because he was a, he was a great pitcher. I mean, great guy, made everybody look uncomfortable. But for some reason, when I got in the box, I saw the ball like a watermelon. And it just happens for some guys. Altuve to center, but he got under that one. Kelnick fading in. There's one. That's a big out right there for the momentum. Yeah, you get past the home run. Solo home runs normally don't kill you. But to that next hitter to Altuve, that's a big at bat. I mean, if he walks Altuve, it becomes a little, little sketchy. If Altuve gets a hit, it becomes a little sketchy. For him to get that out right there allows him to settle back in and go try to go ahead and get back to what he does and, and finish this game out. And you go back to the A-B for Bregman. He saw six pitches. All of them were in the zone, even though it was 0-2. They're all in the zone, and it seemed like Bregman was all over every pitch. It didn't matter if it was a fastball or a slider. He was able to get the barrel to the ball. Granted, if he pulled it foul or hit it the other way foul, he was on the pitches, and he's able to see the ball big off a of seawall. Why not try and kind of coax him into chasing a pitch? Waste one at 0-2, no? Easier said than done. I'm sure he was trying, yeah. yeah. Brantley to center, but again gets under it. And Kelnick this time will back up a few steps. Very similar spot. Well, with an 8-5 score in the ninth, a four-run top of the inning for Seattle gives us some extra options for today's YouTube player of the game, Abraham Toro. Jared Kelnick, who tied this one up at four. Marmalejos had the go-ahead knock to make it 6-4. And J.P. Crawford with that two-run job after Marmalejos. Those are your options. Poll opens now. Louis Gurriel, wave and a miss. Quick, give us your pick. I'm a big Marmalejos guy, especially if the score stays right here where it is. If you get the game-winning hit, game-winning RBI, and you got a couple hits, that has to play. I'm with you, partner. Riel skies one. And oh. here's Raleigh. Game over. The Seattle Mariners top the Houston Astros on a Wednesday afternoon by a final score of eight to five. And they salvage a game in this three game set. And they inch a little bit closer in the American League West standings. They are now five and a half back of Houston and also just two and a half games out of a wild card seat. Great game there by the Mariners, being able to come through another close game and doing what they do. It's not a one-run game, but it felt like a one-run game when it's all said and done. They're able to come through late bullpen, lock it down. Great at-bats by Marmalejos, Crawford, Kelnick, late in the game to keep the pressure on and escape with the win and have a happy flight. That's Seattle's specialty. Winning close games late. Let's talk all about it. 30 minutes devoted to the Mariners and the Astros and this tight ball game are right now. This is the MLB Game of the Week live on YouTube post game show presented by YouTube Shorts. It's a done deal. The Mariners do have a happy long flight back as they take a win over the Houston Astros. Seattle's off tomorrow, and then they start up a six-game homestand with three against Arizona, a team they just swept, and then three against the Boston Red Sox, a team that they're chasing for a wild card seat. So this is schedule, which we'll get into a little bit more in a few, looks, I would say, favorable just based on the fact that Seattle either is taking on some weaker opponents or some teams that they are chasing in the standings. And this was a huge W and just an absolute pleasure to call it. Scott Braun along with Chris Young, CY. Yeah, this was tight as can be, back and forth, and we saw both teams show off some of their best strengths. And they needed to escape today with a win. Coming off those first two losses to start this series, I said coming into this series, if you're playing the Astros, it's understandable if you don't win the series, but you can't come in and get swept, especially when you're getting the opportunity to go home and play Arizona, a team that you should beat. You like your chances against them. 
this sets up that homestand that you have coming up. Yeah, bring some momentum into that six-game homestand for Seattle. And whoever takes that second wild card in the American League is going to go on a run at some point over the next three weeks because there are quite a few teams involved. So who's going to get hot? The Mariners actually were surging right before this series. They had won five in a row. Astros take the first two in this series on Monday and Tuesday, but Seattle pulls off a W. And they had a lead that they gave up. Houston was up by two at one point. And then Seattle battles back, thanks to Jared Kelnick. We'll get you all of the highlights in just a few, but we have some other business to take care of first, including the U2 player of the game, which we'll do in just a moment, and also a couple post-game interviews that we'll go over. Nice first game to have you on here Great first on game. YouTube. Yeah, action. Come back anytime and hang out with <laughs> us for the next 30 minutes, too, right here on YouTube. And let's... Bring in the big man, Jose Marmalejos. Comes through with the two RBI knock as the Seattle Mariners took the lead over Seattle in the ninth inning. Thanks to Marmalejos against the all-star Ryan Presley. And Jose joins us right now. Jose, congratulations on the W and the big hit. And first off, just take us through that at-bat against one of the better relief pitchers in Major League Baseball. What did you see? Uh, thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. And honestly, um, I was just looking to stay short, not not get uh, too long of a swing or anything. Just ha have a good swing, like for the team, you know. So I was looking for something out and over, and I just happened to get it right there and just try to put the the bat to the ball. Honestly, didn't try to do too much, and it worked out. It feels awesome. It's a major blessing. Yeah, that was great, Jose. Chris Young here, man. Seeing you in that situation, be able to take a ball off the plate. And take it through the middle of the field. It doesn't matter about the shift or whatever it may be. You were able to put the bat on the ball and make something happen for your team. With the loss that y'all had yesterday, how big was that for you to be able to come through in that situation? I mean, it's, it's a major blessing, like I said. Like I said, and I mean, it's always it's always gratifying to be able to you know to do something to help your team win. You know, and this this came in a big moment, and I'm truly thankful for the opportunity and like trusting me to put me in the lineup and everything. So thankful with this team and. It's awesome to have this win and um, take it back to a homestand. Jose, are you also thankful for the shift? Sometimes it burns hitters in the big leagues, but this time it went to a spot where Carlos Correa might usually be. So what did you think about the placement of the baseball? I mean, yeah, like, like I have a saying, sometimes it's all about the placement, and right there it worked <laughs> out, you know? Like, yeah, shifts will, will mess you up sometimes, but, you know, it worked out, and I'm so thankful, so blessed. And because of that hit, the fans vote you as the YouTube player of the game. Here comes the trophy. Ooh. And get ready, okay? I know oh, you're a big, yeah. strong dude, but there <laughs> you go, you. Jose. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate How does that it. feel? That, that feels amazing. This this feels amazing. This is really nice. Look at this. It's got some weight to it. Yeah. It'll have your name on it. We'll get it engraved for you as this is a special day with the Mariners being watched worldwide on YouTube and picking up a huge win. Did it have a playoff feel in terms of the intensity? I mean, we saw a ton of pitchers in this game. For I believe sure. for Houston, there were, I think, eight pitchers that were in the game for Dusty Baker's crew. You had bullpens that were saved up. You have off days for both teams tomorrow. So what was the feeling in the dugout about how this game was playing out from a strategic standpoint? Well, no, for sure. It felt if the adrenaline was there, we wanted to just get out there and play baseball and just – try to win a, a pitch after pitch and a bat after a bat we were locked in like the, the team never gave up we were we were grinding and like this this team is amazing you know everybody wants to wants to be there want to get it done and we were locked in and I, it's just a blessing like we got this win and we got to take it home and just keep it going keep it rolling happy flight right yeah happy flight <laughs> for sure <laughs> to be able to come through in that big situation you had the big double off the wall the base hit to take the lead how do you think your team will be able to carry this momentum to, to play against Arizona when you get home? I don't know for sure. I mean, the work ethic here is amazing. And um, I will tell you that this is a team that will not give up. And, like, just with the work ethic, uh, grinding every single day, being – like having the concentration to keep going, I mean, this, this, this is a really special team. This is a really good team. You had a special season at AAA this year, too. You were crushing the baseball. You were among the AAA West leaders this season. So how did you feel your season went in AAA? And then how do you try and carry that momentum 
into the big leagues. Are there certain aspects of your game that stood out this year that you want to make sure are continuing in the big leagues for this stretch run? Definitely a major blessing to the season that I had in AAA for sure. And um, I just I just want to keep um, working every single day on the work ethic. Don't get ahead of myself. Just trusting that everyday process that was working for me. Don't try to get ahead or think about the past. Just live in the moment and at the same time just trusting the work ethic of every day and trusting my 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 coaches and teammates. I love the energy. I love the mindset, Jose. Where will you put that trophy in your house, though? Oh, this is going to be right next to the TV so I could just see it every, every single time. <laughs> right there. Makes sense, right? You stream YouTube onto your TV exactly. and it's right next to you and we'll send you one with your name on it. Jose, congratulations on the victory on winning YouTube player of the game. Have a happy flight and good luck the rest of the way in this fight for a postseason spot for Seattle. Thank you very much, guys. I truly appreciate it. You guys have a good one. You too. Thanks, Jose, Jose Marmalejos is your YouTube player of the game with the trophy. It was tight. Look at this race. This was one of the tighter races we had this year. Mariners fans and everyone else watching here on YouTube say that Jose Marmalejos is the player of the game. 31% of the pie, but everyone was at 20% plus. So it was a team contribution for this victory. That helps to tell the story, and we'll give you much more on the game story in a moment. What a series, what a finish to this one between the Mariners and the Astros. Astros took the first two in the series, and then the Mariners grab the last meeting in 2021 in the regular season between Seattle and Houston here at Minute Maid Park. Scott Braun and Chris Young watching the highlights of this game and how it played out. If you missed anything, it looked like this. Abraham Toro fits the mold as he digs in with the bases loaded. Toro rips one to right field. Plenty of open space. He's in business. And the Mariners crack the scoreboard first. Here's Hanniger. And Seeger will score as well. It's a two RBI two bagger for Abraham Toro. And he continues to punish his former squad. Now it's Correa, Mr. Walkoff man from yesterday in the 10th. He rips that one right into the club at the hot corner of Kyle Seeger. Wow. That's rocket retrieval right there. That's when you go into the dugout and everybody says, nice swing. And you're like, man, I'm not trying to hear that. That should have taken his glove off of his hand right there. So Alvarez at first, one out for Tucker. Tucker into left center. Kelnick chasing it, and it's going to hop up against the wall. Alvarez heading for third, and he's being waved home, and here he comes. Throw is not in time. The Astros are on the board. It's an RBI double for Kyle Tucker to bring home Alvarez and make it 2-1. to one. Now Marwin Gonzalez, some huge hits in his Houston career. He played with the Astros from 2012 to 2018. Gonzalez takes off to the Crawford boxes. Forget about it. The Astros grab the lead 3-2 off a two-run shot from Marwin Gonzalez. 
Welcome back to Houston, Marwin. Nice homecoming right there, huh? Two outs, Seager at second base. Here is Terenz. Mariners down 3-2. Here's the pitch. It's an off-speed pitch pulled to the left side on a slide as Gonzalez gets up and throws out to Renz. Beautiful play to his left for Marvin Gonzalez, doing what he does. And we'll go to the bottom of the third at Minute Maid Park. The Astros lead it 3-2. to two. Abraham Toro is one for two and hits the first pitch the other way. Left center field, Myers chasing it, and he's got the baseball. Now heading back to first, and in there safely is Kyle Seeger. Jake Myers with the closing speed. Wow, what a catch. What a great play. Altuve, the leadoff man, homered yesterday, 2-1. Is ripped. Left field, does he have it on back-to-back -back days? He does! Jose Altuve didn't homer for about a month. Goes long yesterday and doubles up this afternoon. It's number 27 on the season. Make it 4-2, Houston. And we keep rolling in the seventh. First and third two outs. Phil Maton into the game. Oh, it just takes one pitch for Jared Kelnick to like it. That one's off the wall, and it scores two, and it ties the game at four, CY. And that's when things really turned up. And Seattle knew, at this point, we got our clutch knock from a rookie. Now we need to put this game away. but. There's a lot more action still. Second and third two outs. Ty France is the batter. And I mean, he has come up clutch so often for Seattle. But this time, Marvin Gonzalez is able to put him away and preserve this 4-4 game. And that brings us to Carlos Correa against Diego Castillo in the eighth. And Castillo was like, oh, man. And we're looking at him like, what's he, what's he upset about? Castillo had his stuff working today. He had that sinker-slider combo down in the zone, off the plate, expanding, and had the Astros on their heels. Yeah, and he struck out the side after that. No big deal. In the ninth, this is Jose Marmaleos, Mr. YouTube player of the game. He's putting the trophy right next to the TV at home. And that's the ideal of hitting it where they ain't. Yeah. I mean, he, he had some big at-bats, had a double earlier in the game, and then Crawford comes up to put a little cushion on it. Give Seawall some cushion to come out and finish the game off and close it out, other than the homer to break. Yeah, which, you know, it happens it on happens. back to back days. Solo homers, whatever. <laughs> they had a four run lead, which really helped. Then it was three, then it was Guriel in foul ground, and the Mariners securing an 8 5 W over the Houston Astros. Houston drops to 81 and 52 on the season, or make that 81 and 58. Seattle is now 76 and 64 in the year. Astros still in a comfortable spot, five and a half games up in the AL West. The Mariners are two and a half games away from a playoff seat, that second wild card. Let's get more on this game in another interview. Brett Dolan, take it away. Certainly, Scott. Well, the Seattle Mariners won an extra inning game for the 15th time this season today. That is by far and away the most in Major League Baseball. Now to do that, you need some late inning hits, which they were able to get in kind in that 10th uh, inning. You also need contributions from some big time players earlier in games. Even some of those guys that started the year as Houston Astros like Abraham Toro had a chance to catch up to Abraham just a few moments ago. Joined by Abraham Toro. First of all, Abraham, after last night, how big was this win for the Mariners? Oh, you know, it just feels good to bounce back. Uh, yesterday was, was a tough loss, but you know, it's a guy we, we came from some attitude and we have some good at bats and you know, we, we got that relative late in the inning and that felt good. You had one of those good at bats early and knocked in a couple of runs with a double. You have 14 RBIs against your former team. What is it about the focus in these head to head at bats? Well, it's, it's something like I know a lot about them, but they know a lot about me. So it's just that that adjustment. I was able to do my homework and, you know, it, it paid off. When I'm thinking about your situation with the Seattle Mariners, I'm thinking about two playoff shares, one from the Astros, one from the Mariners. What would it take for Seattle to make a run to get into this postseason some way, somehow? You know, just our, our, our pitches have been really good. You know, they've been a lot of low scoring games and, you know, just the offense is starting to click. And I think, you know, if we keep going, we can we can make a push for the playoffs. Congratulations on the win. All right, thank you. That's Abraham Toro. You watch Abraham Toro or Marmaleos just a few moments ago with the guys. There's one thing that stands out, smiles, right? Winning is supposed to be fun. This is an organization that is trying to build to be relevant in September. They've been able to pick up some key wins. I know last night certainly stung. 
today, though, able to sneak one away from the Houston Astros, and certainly they're enjoying the ride for this final game of this road trip before they head home to try and find a little more magic in Seattle. Mariners, though, win in 10 innings today over the Houston Astros. We'll step aside and return to Minute Maid Park right after this. There are few moments like it. Moments that compare to arriving here. And despite all of us going to the same place, we all come for different reasons. Some come for the sights. Some for the sounds. Some come for the bombs. Some for the bonds. Some come for passion. Some come for the plays. We all come to be part of something bigger than ourselves. And regardless of what you come for, there's a ticket for you. Astros season tickets. For the H. finish in this one at Minute Maid Park in Houston inside hot day out there. I mean, you live right around the corner. This is the regular weather we've been dealing with over the past month plus, right? Mid 90s, you're feeling it too, a little sweat. This is summertime in Houston, quite a bit of humidity in the air, so I'm very grateful that they had that roof closed today because if they did not, we would definitely be feeling that heat. Yeah, no sweat, all right? Inside here at Minute Maid Park, temperature controlled. Astros had grabbed the first two in this series, and then they fall to Seattle. 8-5 is your final score for the YouTube Game of the Week. Scott Braun along with Chris Young. CY here for the first time with us on YouTube this season. And we've had Houston a few times this year, and we've gushed over all of the strengths of this team because there are many. There's a reason why they're leading the American League West, and they look like one of the juggernauts in Major League Baseball. There just aren't many flaws at the moment. There was one. It was the bullpen. And then they picked up three, four pieces, and it's made a huge difference for this club. And, yes, I know the bullpen did not help things out today. They did ultimately give things up with Ryan Presley and the blown save. But you look at this team and how they're loaded up for the postseason, it's a special, talented club. They're a special club. And in the American League, you have the Astros. In my, in my opinion, in the National League, you have the Dodgers. Those you think are, those are the top two? Those are two complete teams that are primed and ready for the playoffs. You have plus starting pitching. Granted, Astros don't have the superstar names like the Dodgers have, but the guys that they have, they have five, six quality starters that can go out there and give you a good five, six, seven innings in the playoffs. On top of that, you have a dominant offense. We saw that today. No matter if you're top of the lineup or all the way down to the seven, eight hole, especially with Bregman in the lineup every day, you don't have any holes. You don't have any holes, and you have Maldonado at the bottom who's catching a great game and, you know, running the pitching staff perfectly. So you have in the AL the Astros over the Rays. If you had to guess right now, do you think they're a more complete ball club than Tampa Bay? When I'm watching as the fan, mm -hmm. 
I would favor the Astros. I understand what the numbers may go against that. I understand all the things that the Rays have done this season. Just as a fan of the game, when I watch these two teams play, the Astros, the Rays have been there before as well, but the Astros are primed, and I feel like if they get to the playoffs, they're going to be a handful. Oh, and if it's Astros-Dodgers in the World Series, Mm. haven't we seen that (laughs) in the recent past? Do those teams like each other? Are they friendly? So. No, not too much. And okay. I don't know if the fan, how the fans feel about each other either. So yeah. I'm sure it would be fun. I would be okay with another <laughs> Astros Dodgers World Series. I think the world would be okay with yeah. all the drama that would bring to the mix. So we also loved having Cal Raleigh with the microphone until he was needed in the game as well later on. But Cal, thank you, and we want to hear the best from Cal today. And also keep in mind he caught the final out in this game. So first off, how did he sound on the microphone? Are you on Dubs? Yeah. Why would they choose you? I, I of all the people to mic up. I said the same thing. I said you want me to do it. The guy that can't even communicate, you're gonna mic him up. Not, it's not my. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not my forte. My uncle has abnormally large hands. He has, at the time. I still think it is. It's the biggest World Series ring ever made. Your uncle has a World Series ring. He does. The Florida Marlins. Really? Was it 03 or 02? He didn't know his ring size, so he went to a ring store. He actually just told the story the other day. He went to a ring, or like a jewelry, whatever, to get sized. Like, you gotta get sized. So he went and they didn't have anything that fit him. And it was a 17 and a half. I don't know what, do they do halves? The biggest thing you've ever seen. His, his sausage fingers. I had a, I went on a kick in high school where I, I really wanted a, a pair of Converse shoes. I don't know why, like a, the high tops, like Larry Bird, like black. Yeah, yeah from Sandlot and all that. So I went on a kick and I just wanted the black and white pair. I don't really have the body to rock them though. I think you gotta kind of be like a skater boy to rock those. Or like, you gotta wear like tight pants and like, you can't wear them with shorts because they're high tops. It's just not my style. Like it just is what it is. I think they're cool. You can rock them. Somebody asked me that one time. They said, so you're, they said, so you're, you're switch hitter, right? I said, yeah. I said, so that means you're amphibious. <laughs> I was like, what? You're amphibious. You hit, you hit both ways. Not exactly. This is this is my chance. I have I have an audience now. If Cody Jinx hears this, I'm going to your concert this off season. So. It's always found me. It's not like he's my walk-up song or anything. Okay, I got to make sure that I reach out to Cody Jenks and his team and we hook up Cal Raleigh, especially for being on YouTube with us, all right? We're going to make sure that connection happens. I'm telling you, it'll be on maybe the last YouTube game of the year that we do, or maybe next week even, you know, we'll be close to Hollywood. You gotta make something happen for him right yeah. there. I'm gonna work on that for you, Cal, okay? And also, you work on getting this team back into the postseason for the first time since 2001. Now, it might not look favorable for them in the division out there in the West in the American League, but the wild card just continues to get tighter. Blue Jays two back out. The Mariners are just two and a half away. They have leapfrogged over the A's over the past week as Oakland has sputtered. They've lost four in a row. And the Yankees and the Red Sox keep coming down to earth and making us think, is this the year that the Seattle Mariners snap the longest active playoff drought among the four major North American pro sports? Do you think it could happen? I think it could happen. And this is a position that they put themselves into. I think if you go to them at the beginning of this season and tell them there'll be a couple of games out, you know, two and a half games out of the wild card, would you take that position? I think they would take it. Right here with the Yankees in Boston, I feel like one, if not both, 
have to give. I think I think Boston could be the one to potentially fall out of there. The Blue Jays have been playing well. They've been a team that I've picked to click all year long. It just hasn't worked out for them, but they have a great team and another great offense in the American League. You know, eventually they'd like to get into the World Series too because it hasn't happened for them and it's the longest active pennant drought in Major League Baseball and it's 45 seasons for Seattle. Now, even if it doesn't happen this year, you're looking at a ball club that has, according to MLB.com, the number two ranked farm system. So when you combine what they're doing on the field right now, and Kelnick, for example, is not on that list anymore. He's not a prospect, okay? They still have four players in the top 40, according to MLB Pipeline. There is a lot of promise. There's a core that is starting to build with the Major League Club, but then there is a ton of talent on the way for a Seattle team that, that's not just thinking about making it to the postseason again. They're trying to build a winner with sustained success to have the prospect capital, you could call it, which helps you, of course, for your big league ball club, but also with trades. They'll have money to spend this offseason. There is a lot of hope. Suddenly, the rain is starting to settle. The it's precipitation starting to settle. is starting and to go away. The Mariners are about to be in a situation to where they could be a really good ball club. You don't want, if you're ownership, you don't want to go, go out there and spend too much money too early if your team isn't primed and ready. But right now, I think they're in a great position. You have Kyle Lewis will be coming back, playing center field. You, that moves Kellenic back to right field. You have Rodriguez, which is a huge prospect, coming up who just played in the Futures game. Julio Rodriguez, number two ranked prospect in all of baseball. Who's coming in, yeah, number two ranked. And like that's a dominating outfield if Kellenic can get back to form. So with that being said, you have three guys out there that you're not paying a lot of money. You have a lot of cap room free. You have some money to spend. It, the Mariners are not a small market team. A no. lot of people assume the Mariners are a small market team, but they're not. They have money to spend, and they can go out there and make a few, a few key additions and be a really good ball club. Some pitchers, an infielder or two. Hey, there are a ton of shortstops that could be available this offseason. I know J.P. Crawford's been great. He can potentially either stay there or move to another spot. There's a lot that they can do. And, hey, let's take you back to Jake Myers covering a ton of ground. StatCast powered by Google Cloud. 10% catch probability means that was a really tough play to make. I'm sitting next to a center fielder, and you know, despite him not diving or going all, I mean, he went all out just in a different way. That is very difficult to pull off, so we bring up our Curious Creators segment and Secret Base, who had our creator spotlight today, wants to say, I think I pulled something watching Jake make that play. Yeah, me <laughs> very, too. Very nice, Secret Base. And that play is a play, you see this 10% probability of making that play that's a play that normally only the home field team will make mainly because Jake knows this outfield he's comfortable with this outfield Dusty Baker told us before the game that he's very comfortable with Myers in center field because he's able to make plays like this I mean that ball is five feet to the left of that wall that's jutting out right there and that could have been a very dangerous play but with great communication from left field right there and Jake being very comfortable with Minute Maid Park, he's able to make that play and get the ball back in. He looks like he's been doing it in this field for years. Jake Myers makes a big play. Astros fall, though, to the Mariners. Two more games to go. Next week on Friday, a night game between the A's fighting for a playoff spot and Shohei Otani and the Angels and then Cardinals Brewers. The Brewers in control of the Central. The Cardinals fighting for a wild card. Oh, we have two good ones on the docket for the rest of the way. See why this was awesome, man. Did you enjoy it? I had a great time. It's yeah. great to be able to do this in my home field. Great to be able to be here with you, and thank you for allowing me to man the booth with you. You crushed it. And then a quick trip home for you, too, which is Absolutely. nice. Absolutely. Enjoyed that. The MLB Game of the Week live on YouTube swings back Friday. A's. Angels, Shohei Otani time. Meet us there. It's a Friday night game. Our pregame show starts up at 9 Eastern. And for my friends, Chris Young, Brett Dolan, and our entire superstar crew, I'm Scott Braun logging out for now. We'll see you next time, next week on Friday night.